All right, well, the show must go on, even though I have a sneeze about to hit me any moment. It's been two minutes, and it's not coming. So we're starting the live stream, and it'll, it'll rear its head when it needs to. So Brian says, oh, yay. Thank goodness for the notifications. That's right. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you don't have notifications on, like on your phone, which on my phone I haven't set it up yet, but on your actual phone, have them turned on. Uh, live streams have just gotten chaotic for me. You know, we used to do them on Mondays. Way back in the day, we used to do them on Sundays. At one point, we did them on Thursdays. We've done them on Wednesdays before. And now I just, uh, I've just got to go when I can go live, you know. And so if you want to be a part of that, you got to have notifications on. you got to have it actually on so you'll get notified. I realize that's a pain in the butt. I realize you might not want that. That's fine. But that's how you do uh, find out when we're going to go live. That's the thing. We get that all at once. Well, when do your live stream? And the reality is, I don't know anymore. Whenever we can, that's that's what we, we do. So, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about maybe some products I'm using in the fish room. Uh, the new fish studio build, I would say. We're going to answer a lot of nerdy questions. I'm hoping to do a little more in-depth as opposed to, my fish sick, what do I do? More, uh, hopefully some, I don't want to say better educated questions, because that's not what I'm looking for either. But something I don't talk about all the time. That's, that's the real thing. Uh, that's a good point. Hello, everyone from Houston, Texas. That's a good place we could start. Uh, so if you've been following our community posts, you've seen that we posted about Charles Clapsaddle and his wife, Susie, and Goliad Farms. Now, we had been out there a couple years ago and filmed, and really, I'm building my current urban fish farm to model that. Like, I, we specifically bought a place that had well water, just like he's got well water. Uh, I've been testing for over a year with those totes not to do any water changes, just top off for evaporation, just like they're doing, using plant fertilization, or not fertilization, but uh, plant filtration. And so it definitely hit me hard when it's like, I didn't even, in my mind, I've been so busy, right? I've just been so busy, like, okay, you know, yesterday is like, okay, go work, go work, go work. Today went to the gym, and then it's like, okay, I got some free time, I should live stream. And so I didn't even, didn't even dawn on me that, like, wait, Texas freezing over what about Goliad farms what about all the aquarists what about all of that stuff like you see it but it's in the peripheral vision of uh you know i've got leaky roofs and that kind of stuff i've got my own fires going on and i di didn't comprehend so seeing the videos of the devastation that they've endured was um disheartening i would say it's like oh wow that's i've got some of his fish you know so i've got some of his fish in my fish room right now and I know that some of the lines have been working on for 10 plus years, selectively breeding. He's got fish that no one else has got because he invented them. He's also got a lot of other popular stuff that sells. And they do sell online, by the way, which right now, obviously, they're probably not shipping anything. But, you know, maybe keep it in the back of your brain. If you're looking for some live bears or African cichlids down the road, Goliad Farms could supply you some. So anyway... <clears throat> What I really gleaned from that, though, is this is, you know, someone that's been doing this for a very long time. You know, I, I don't know how long, but at least I've been um, admiring his work for like 12 plus years. And he was been doing well even before that, right? They had multiple generators. They had lots of contingency plans. They've been through disasters before. Katrina hit him, like another one hit him. Uh, I don't remember what the other disaster was, but they've been hit multiple times. And this freeze, <clears throat> they did have a generator set up, and basically there was a flaw. Some, I think it was like a bug nest or something. Basically, it shorted out. And in the time to switch over from the main generator to the backup generator, the pipes froze from the well and burst. So even when they got the generator back on, they... Uh, you know, we're able to do get some things like air pumps and that kind of stuff back online, right? But now they couldn't change any water if they needed to, and there was no, like, basically water, and it was flooding, right? So then they had to worry about heat, and they had some heat sources, right? Then I think they had three of them, and they have <clears throat> multiple greenhouses, right? And for how cold it was going to get, which was abnormal, they needed more and they could not locate more within hundreds of miles. You know, they, they tried it. And so they ran into just problem after problem and it kind of just stacked up And and that's where, you know, sometimes there's nothing you're going to be able to do. You know, a lot of times 
people can look from the outside in and go, well, I would have done, I would have done this, I would have done that. And the reality is you, you may have at the time if you had those resources, but if someone's got multiple you know, water pumps, multiple um, generators, multiple heaters, multiple of all these things, and you still fail to get through it, that's a sign that, you know, it was pretty tough times. And so Aquarius had their, their stuff freeze. And, and so they might not pull through it. And they're contemplating, do they keep going with it? They're already 70 years old. Do they, you know, push forward? And so it just uh, hits extra hard when you see someone who seemingly was prepared. Because they started prepping once they got word of the, st of the storm, right? They started prepping before that. They already had stuff. But... You know, they spent a whole week prepping, then the storm hits and they're, you know, losing power and and all of that. And then they still end up, I don't want to call it a failure because it's like they did everything they could do, but it wasn't enough. That's the problem. It wasn't enough. Even their best wasn't enough to beat this. And that's just a hard thing to watch. And as they're pulling out these adult fish and the breeders, and you kind of know that without the adults, there's not going to be the babies, which means if there's no babies, there's nothing to sell, Right. And so this is going to be another year for them, essentially, where the sales are going to be very minimal. And that's really hard. I mean, fish farming or any kind of farming, agriculture, that stuff's hard because you've got nature to deal with, all of that, right? Um, so I, I obviously reached out. and I was like, let me know if there's anything I can do. They were very appreciative that we sent people over to kind of just watch the videos and to see what was going on. And then... Um, he's still, we, we still already had, we had plans before this happened. The plan was once kind of COVID was done, we were going to go and film and just do more stuff down there because I really enjoy it. Um, and we still have that invite, which is good, you know, and he, you know, he, they're very gracious, not gracious, gracious, very nice people. And, you know, they want to know what they could do for me. And I go, well, there's nothing to do for me. You already let us in to film your, your, your setup. And right now you've got a lot going on. Like, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. There's a lot of people clamoring for GoFundMes and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, as, as I have witnessed lots of things over the years, let people kind of announce when they need that help or want that help and how they can help. Because, you know, maybe a GoFundMe is not what they need. Maybe they need something else, right? And maybe they've got a different plan. And so... Right now, it's just a, a slow, well, let's just see what happens, offer support, watch what's going on. Maybe they got a different plan. They already talked about perhaps pivoting to shrimp and snails and those types of things. And so <clears throat> I'll do what I can, you know, and I can talk about them. I can, you know, learn from it. And uh, if they end up needing help, they'll, I'm sure they'll create ways to do that. But I'm not going to go out of my way because I've seen that happen too often where someone just starts a rogue GoFundMe and then there's all kinds of tax implications. There's, you know, I would have never started that. I was going to do this and that's going to happen. And I was taking a loan from the bank and now that's messed up. And now I've got income on paper. And so I like to just uh, kind of be on the sidelines, let them know. I've, you know, we, we, we talk through email and stuff like that, even when there's not storms going on. So um, rest assured that if there's help needed, He'll announce it on his YouTube channel or it'll come, you know, he'll ask me for something um, and we'll do what we can, you know. And I'm very cautious here because there are a lot of people who have had a lot of problems, um, you know, different situations and we cannot help everyone. And so uh, in general, we have a policy of we, we are, uh, what do you want to say? What do I want to say? We don't say who we help, right? So if we're donating to different funds or Amazon things, we don't really announce it because whenever we do, we just get inundated with like 70 different GoFundMes. You know, it's like my brine shrimp can's half empty. I need more. And then, there, you know, and that's, that's obviously hyperbole. But, you know, there's from very not very serious things. Like we, we actually saw one come in like the last month. Someone was asking if we could share their GoFundMe and it was to pay their bills and then i was like wait a second this customer has spent a lot of money in the last month at our store and i'm like this is that's not you, you know it, that'd be like me going well i bought 10 lamborghinis guys so i'm gonna run a gofundme now to 
pay my bills. Like, it's kind of like, well, that's, you know, and there's people obviously that are really struggling out there, lots of people struggling. So um, we try to help more behind the scenes. And so we don't have to, it's a very difficult situation when you're like, well, who's thing you're going to promote? And this one just happened to hit right in that we'd already been there. And it would almost be a disservice to not follow up on what is going on with that farm. And so, yeah. All right, enough, uh, you know, doom and gloom there. They've got good spirits at least, and that's good to hear, so. What's the best water for my mystery snails? Now there's that super technical question I was looking for. Uh, hard water, you want hard water with high pH. You can do that with wonder shells, equilibrium, uh, crushed coral, mixing in other uh, calcium elements. You can use eggshell. But basically, the higher pH and the harder you can get the water, that will benefit them. Now, they don't have to have crazy hard water and crazy high pH, but if you're, you know, what is the best water for them, that's kind of where you would, you would go with that. Hmm. Will variegated aquatic plants be available anytime soon? Um... So I don't know of too many farms producing variegated plants. So the only one I can really think of that really sold well for us but is has disappeared was, uh, uh, what is it, the watermelon plant, Limnophilia, what was it? I got to Google it. It's Limnophilia, I'm pretty sure. Let me see if I can find it. Ugh. Watermelon plant didn't bring it up. I must be wrong. I must be wrong. I know we can get the non variegated version fairly easy, but I cannot find what I'm thinking about. Aquarium watermelon. Why can I not think of the scientific name? Well, anyway, uh, I think mostly no one's really cultivating them, and so it gets really hard. Um, we can only really buy what farms are willing to produce. Farms are willing to produce what sells really easily and well, uh, and a lot of the cult of culture variants just don't sell as well, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I hope for more and more variations, but, you know, right now it's honestly been very hard for farms to get kind of plants in, keep it going. You know, if we think about just COVID things going on where it's like, oh, if you have people get sick at work or extra precautions are being taken, you have less workforce. You also have way fewer flights coming in to um, the United States. So other plants will come from other countries that are grown. And then you have problems like we ordered plants, right? So we last week we had kind of a plant crisis, just like, well, probably a lot of people are having a crisis with the weather, right? And so even though we had snow, right, and Texas had snow and a few other places really had some weather events, Lots of airports were shut down, and it, it kind of created a cascading effect. So I called up to figure out, like, what are we going to do? Because I had fish. I had fish and plants stuck in California, and I had plants stuck in Florida all at the same time. And it's Monday morning, and I'm going, uh-oh, stuff, flights were getting canceled. So even though it was coming from warm states, right, and that's typically not a problem, you go, oh, warm state, warm state. Yeah, they'll ship. Their airports aren't closed. What had happened was a cascading effect where because of COVID, right, less people are flying. So let's say we're at one-third the flights that normally fly. Let's just, I don't know what that number is, but let's say it's one-third. So there's one-third less flights. Now the flights that were there, if they were getting canceled, it's not as easy to just rebook. Like, okay, yeah, you're here. Let's rebook you at uh, two hours from now and you fly out that no longer those didn't those weren't there so then what happened was they 
first, and I asked them, and they're like, okay, our first priority is moving people around. Our second priority is moving their luggage around. Third priority is then uh, United States Postal Service. And then it's cargo. So that's where my plants and my fish come in is fourth. And we had heard a term we have never seen in business, and I've been doing this for 10 plus years at this point, And that was, there was a cargo embargo to Washington State. That means no one was allowed to ship any packages towards Washington State because they were already four days behind. So that means that if you had shipped on a Monday, it's supposed to land like eight hours later. It's not going to land till a Friday now. And so because they were already four days behind, that meant that our Florida vendors and our uh, California vendors could no longer ship to us at all. We actually found another airline that was willing to fly some, and now it's better. So that's the good news. This week, we're back to normal, right? But things have gotten so bad, and that's where you start seeing uh, farms lose revenue. And so that's how it ties back into why aren't the farms doing this and that. They've had a hard year. The reality is, you know, you got illness and, and, you know, extra costs around business from COVID. Then you've got these supply issues coming in and then you get random weather events preventing stuff from going out. And, you know, there's been, you know, it's not just the farm industry, but, you know, we basically need a few years of things normalizing and then farms go, okay, let's work on getting some of these new species. Because right now it's like money can't buy an Amazon sword. We're buying as many as we can get our hands on. But if you can't fulfill a basic Amazon sword as a farm, you're not going to go, let me go get the super rare plant and grow that. Instead, you're going, okay, what resource can we do to get our basic bread and butter plants going? Cause they're already selling. We've got demand for them. And then when that is flowing nicely again, then that's when you bring in some of that stuff. So we as hobbyists, you know, now I take my business hat off and as a hobbyist, we're basically just going to have to live with less selection. I mean, we've got less selection on fish and plants and, you know, we should be thankful that we have a selection at all. Like even your basic fish and plants are amazing. Sir, sure, selection is down compared to other years, but we should also know that those years are really good. Right. And so when the years are good, definitely take advantage of that. So yeah, that, that went down the nerm hole, I think. I know I'm missing some super chats. Let me see if I can find those. Wow, lots. Okay. Have I ever kept Borneo redfin silver sharks, redfin balas? I haven't. I've been looking and I cannot find any anywhere. Is it possible? Any possible help or advice? So Borneo redfin silver sharks. My guess is I'm going to Google them and make sure that I haven't kept them. Okay, I see them. They remind me a lot of uh, like pink-tailed Celsius, kind of similar in that vein. I have not seen I have not seen this fish in the trade for me to buy. That being said, I have not looked for them either. Uh, I think the problem you're going to run into with a fish like this is that. Well, let me see if I can put that up for you guys. So you can see. Well, this. Will this work or will this be a train wreck? We'll we'll hope for the the best here. There we go. Yep. So this fish right here, I think the problem you run into it is it's kind of not as good as a rose line. It's not kind of as cool looking as a pink tail Celsius. Same with like a flag tail Prochilotus. And so you get this like, okay, who's going to import this? Is there enough demand outside of like the people collecting oddballs? That's what you run into. And so I think it's going to be few and far between. I I would maybe look to see if like Oliver Lucanus brings any in into Canada. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a decent looking fish, but do they also call that a cigar shark? Let me, let me Google that. They, they're, they're now they're reminding me closer to cigar sharks. No, cigar sharks are are still much bigger. So, yeah, so this right here is a cigar shark. 
I was just thinking like maybe, but I think when you get into those super oddballs like that, it's the true NERM that's seeking that out for a biotope or something like that. And it's just, it's not commercially viable, I think. I think that's what it comes down to is, is this going to be a big seller across a lot of markets? If the answer is no, let's bring in a different fish. And I think that's the way um, commerce currently works. So short of you go into the Borneo and collecting them and you can, like I ran into this too you could find that that's been classified as a food fish. Uh, I ran into that with the really cool tetras I wanted to bring back, and we caught them and all that, and then when it went time to export, technically these are classified as a food fish, even though everyone there was like, no one has ever eaten these. Like, that's not a thing. But, you know, sometimes things get classified, and then that could be why you're not having it coming in too. Am I having a lovely day? I am having a pretty good day. Any day where I get the time, like the downtime that I can stream, that's a pretty good day. Because th the things that have to line up for me to stream is I gotta have the time available. I gotta be in a decent mood. It doesn't, it doesn't do you any good to have like a big crisis going on and then be like, I'm gonna go live stream. Meanwhile, you're thinking about something else the whole time. So usually if I have the chance to live stream, things are going pretty good that day and uh, you know, it's, it's like my break time. You know, I had I had a fish sandwich and uh, came with a Diet Coke. And things are good, so. Ooh, lost my King Chili Red Arowana today. It sucks. That does suck. I, I hate it when anyone loses their pet fish. Now, a pet fish to me is very, very different than a fish, right? So Hank was a pet fish. Ladybird's a pet fish. Murphy's a pet fish, right? My Ellipsifer eel, which you guys have only seen if you're watching the stories on YouTube, uh, that is going to be one of my pets, right? Where like Dean, Dean pretty much only has one pet, and that's his lungfish. He's got lots of fish, right? But when you lose, and I, I would assume this King Chili Red uh, Arowana was a pet, you know, it's been with you a long time. It's got a name. It, you, you look at it every day. You feed it every day. You interact with it every day. Whereas each Cardinal Tetra, I don't go, well, how's Steve doing? And how's Mary doing? It's like, okay, there's a Cardinal Tetra that I feed them, right? So that's always, it's always hard. And uh, what I do like is once you get past the sadness, there is that opportunity. Now you've got this presumably large aquarium. You get a chance to do something else. For most people, not everyone, you probably have been in a situation where it's like you kept that pet for a long time, you've daydreamed about other stuff you wanted to do, now you have that opportunity. Um, my recommendation is you kind of bury that under a tree and you kind of, you always remember that pet and go, hey, yeah, you know, he lives under that tree and I remember, you know, the good times and I remember when he jumped out and he grabbed that cricket on the tongs or whatever, you know, whatever your story is going to be with that fish, so... Yeah, I feel you. I've been there, and uh, not, it's not fun. It gets better, though. You'll, you'll, you'll find a way to replace it, hopefully. Not, you know, not that you can replace it, but you know what I mean. Like, you'll move on. Like, when you lose a dog, eventually you move on, you get another dog, and then you just focus all your energy into that. Not that you don't miss your old dog, but now you have a new responsibility. All right. Wow, $80 Super Chat. Well, thank you, Michael Young. If you're not a uh, member yet, which I'm not watching the chat at this point, but if you're not a member yet, I always encourage people, please become a member. You know, that would have bought you over a year's worth of membership, and then you get a few extra videos. By the way, I was going to release a video today. After the live stream, I will re release a members-only video. I filmed it last week, and I was going to release it today, but I went live, so I'll put it afterwards so if you become a nerm today you'll get f a free extra video right afterwards then you can watch the whole backlog of all the nerm videos so for excellent customer service and business philosophy i ordered a light in january which usps lost for a month candy kindly shipped out a replacement and then they both were delivered in the same day wanted to pay you back for the light and the shipping well thank you very much we do really appreciate that uh, i was talking with another person who does ship stuff and they thought it was weird that we consider it our responsibility when something doesn't arrive. And they're like, well, USPS is at fault. And I go, well, sure. But, you know, in the transaction, someone purchased something from me. I collect the money and I ship them the thing. If they don't receive the thing, 
they're looking to me to go, hey, I didn't get my thing. Now, I'm using a third party, right, USPS to deliver it, but it's my responsibility to try and go get my money back from USPS, not the customer's responsibility. And so we really try hard not to ever have to get people involved on the other end and be like, hey, can you can you call your local post office? Can you do this? Like sometimes we have to. Sometimes like, okay, this, this is a wicked big order or we – we got in contact and they're saying you have to get in contact to okay it or whatever. But, you know, we, we, we understand that, you know, you wanted it right the first time. We're going to try to get that happening. And we know also know that if we're shipping, you know, 15,000 packages a month, if a hundred of them have a problem, we just got to make that right. You know, it's a very small minority of problems, but that means that if we have a hundred packages that have a problem, that's three a day, you know? And so it's like, okay, yeah, we're just gonna always have problems. And probably for candy and things like that, it will feel like there's nothing but problems. Well, that's, we have to deal with the problems, but it's easy to put aside like, oh, 14 plus thousand shipments went great, 100 went bad. And uh, that's what a lot of times, I think we as hobbyists and just people in general, like every time, you know, your food is burnt, or, you know, your package doesn't come, we're angry. But the reality is we don't have the same uh, appreciation for when it's not burnt, right? And when it's not late, we just go, oh, yeah, that's what I ordered. Mm, that's good. You know, oh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, my package is here. Oh, good. We don't, you know, so we tend to focus on the negative. And so, yeah, I'm glad that, uh, you know, our, our team's running as normal if, there's a, a crazy bad delay or something arrives broken. Our mantra is reship it, you know, with a little bit of detail. Like we look into the back end, we ask for pictures, we do enough. So it's not just like we're just sending all the stuff free all the time. Um, and history helps, by the way. So if you haven't made an account on our website, that goes a long way. Uh, it's kind of like Amazon, right? Where if you see a pattern of like this person's returned 7 million times, you eventually stop selling to them going, hey, you just return everything. But if you go, oh, yeah, look at this person. They've ordered a bunch. And there's never been a problem. You know, not a bunch as in like a bunch of money, but even we've got people that will just order $20 worth of stuff a few times a month, right? And it's like, oh, we've done 20 orders. never been a problem. Highly likely this person is having this problem, and therefore we'll just take care of it. So uh, by making an account, that bundles up all your purchases so you're not just kind of a guest checkout, right? You'll, be, you'll have an account. We'll know how many times you purchased with us what you've bought in the past, like, oh, you've had lights in the past. They didn't have problems. Oh, this one must be legit. It helps us troubleshoot for you. So if you buy, you know, if you're on your ninth can of uh, brine shrimp, right, and you get can number nine, you're like, hey, there's something wrong with this can. We had that. We had one can that had gotten packaged upside down, and so it was like this, right? And they brought it to our attention, and we go, oh, yeah, you bought that before. Oh, Okay. Yeah, we didn't have to like, you know, oh, are you sure you're doing it right? It's mostly like, oh, look at that. And so that does help us in customer service go, what's the experience level with this product? Maybe they don't know how to connect the app. Maybe they don't know how to do this. So now it's time to pay some bills since I picked this up. Uh, our brine shrimp eggs are awesome. We brought in a ton of them, hatching really well. We're developing a few more products to go with it. So that's coming down the pipeline, but you're hatching out brine or thinking about hatching out brine, I highly recommend ours. Now, there, are, there have been plenty of detractors of our brine shrimp eggs. They're expensive. They say that better hatch rates. I'm not in the game of proving other companies to be bad. So I can say this. We have run our own independent studies. Dean has... <laughs> Dean is pretty much ready to write a scholarly paper on brine shrimp with the amount of testing he's done on his own personal thing because Dean is invested in these eggs too. He honestly believes they're the best, but I don't want to release any of the results because by me releasing the results, one, some people will think we've skewed them to make us look better. And then two, by nature of showing that ours are better than company A, B, and C, it possibly could take away from them, and I don't want to do that. So what I will say is I still believe this is the best brine shrimp egg on the market. Um, I believe that most people, right, 
need about this 100 gram size. This is gonna last someone quite a while if you've got five or six fish tanks. Um, we are considering bringing on the one pound can long term and that would handle that more of like a Dean and me level where, okay, we're hatching out tons. We burn through a can. Dean goes through a can like every 10 days. So he uses a lot of brine shrimp eggs and he's done a lot of testing. So we, we realize that our product is not competitive with someone who is buying massive amounts of eggs all the time. There, but we also did not design our product for that market. Our market is you own five or six tanks, you've got maybe three tanks of them that eat brine shrimp and it's gonna last you for like a year and it's gonna hold really well, great hatch rates, um, great separation, right? All of those things. And we're, we've got some other things coming along to help it even better. When you pair product A and product B, it's even better results, right? So yeah, if you're thinking about that, order some, we'd appreciate it. That'll help us pay some bills. Keep the lights on. Melissa Foster says, Pepper Romeo? What is Pepper Romeo? I mean, it's a type of house plant, it looks like. I, I don't know what that is. Oof, I just scrolled down on accident and there's a lot of super chats. So I need to put out my disclaimer there. It is not my intention to only do this for the money or the super chats or anything like that. I will address normal, I call it normal, that's normal chat, but unpaid chat as well. I, I watch that as well. Uh, but I do know that people will get disgruntled some people will if I don't, you know, I paid five dollars. You never answered my question and I feel bad for that. So uh, I have this love hate relationship with Super Chats. One helps keep the lights on and helps us do fun things. On the other hand, uh, you know, that sixth grader in Colorado that's trying to get his question answered or her question answered. Uh, we want to make sure they're getting some time in, too. So I like to swap back and forth. All right, from the normal chat. I'm looking to purchase the air pump from Aquarium Co-op. How easy is it to set up? What size of PVC do you recommend? And should I use metal air valves or the Zis ones in the PVC? All right. Well, Death by Games, we are actually filming that tomorrow. Well, we filmed some of it, and we're filming some more of it tomorrow. Uh, part of what I wanted to explain to people is... I do think linear air piston pumps are the best air pumps for multiple fish tanks like that. Um, we only carry one size. They make five sizes. I own four out of the five sizes. And um, what I really wanted to show people is that the one size we carry, I believe that to be the best for everyone. Now, part of the problem I have in the fish room we're building right now, I've got the biggest pump they have. This thing's like $500 plus or whatever it is, right? it's still too powerful for that fish room, right? I, I use it in my store and it works. Um, so I'm gonna actually end up using like two of the smaller ones and really the ones that we sell. What I like about that is it's size number two. So there's one that's smaller, I own that one too. The problem is that one's only like $5 cheaper than the one that does like 30% more. So it's really hard to justify like carrying another size, be like, it'll do, you know, less tanks for $5 less. Like, ugh. So this, this one, right? And when it really what it comes down to is wattage. So this big air pump I have, let's say it uses 100 watts. Well, let's 150 watts. That's more like it, right? Use 150 watts. And the small one uses 45 watts that we sell, I believe. That's right. I need two of those. That's 90 watts right? But those extra 60 watts every month is costing me money for air I'm not using, right? And over time, you're going to save a ton of money. And so even though like two of these smaller pumps at like 230 bucks, you're going, ah, it's 460 bucks. You could have got the bigger pump, right? But every month that bigger pump costs you more money, one third more. And so it ends up, you save more money by having this. Now, what also happens, once you have this big pump, you have the problem I have. It doesn't do smaller rooms. So 
when I scaled down my fish room, right? Remember when I had 70 plus tanks and it was all on cinder blocks? I used a big pump because there, you know, lots of fish tanks have multiple, multiple air stones and all that kind of stuff going. I was doing the ponds outside. This sat for three years, basically, doing nothing because I needed a smaller one. But if I had had three or two smaller ones, right, it will always scale down with you. And that's the good thing about the linear air piston pumps is they work, you can just add them on. Like if you have one with one piston and you add another one with one piston, now you have two pistons, right? And if the big one runs four pistons, right, you can't just go, well, I only need two of them to run. That It can't work that way. So that's why we chose to run one or sell one of them. And I do believe it'll handle most people because it handles up to 45, 50-ish air drops. Now, depending on how deep it is, if those are 300 gallons versus 10 gallons, there's obviously variance there. But most people don't run, uh, they don't start out with more than 50 tanks. And so it handles probably 80% of people. And then those people that do go above that, that's where, like, oh, you just add another one. And very often people over years, like a decade, will go, oh, I had to slim down my fish room. I expanded a little bit. Then it went down a little bit. Then I added the ponds and I took those away. And that allows you that flexibility to do that. So uh, that's why we sell the one size. Now, to the rest of your question, asking about um, the metal air valves or the ZIS ones, I use both. And so what does that mean? That means that on the actual PVC manifold loop that will run all the way around the studio, we'll use the metal ones. They thread in, we show you how to do that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when I get to the tank or the pond or whatever it is, so you have airline tubing, right? Hashtag best airline tubing ever, food grade PVC from the aquarium co-op. But you'll get that airline tubing. It'll go from your air source to your tank. And then instead of having to get up on a ladder and adjust or anything like that, right at the tank is where I want to be able to adjust. So if I want to turn it off, turn it up, turn it down, that's where I use the ZIS valve. I use that one right there. From there, I go to, you know, like a sponge filter. And inside the sponge filter, I put in the Never Clog Air Stone. You guys will watch all that unfold. And what I will say is, at this point, it would look like a giant commercial in my fish room. Like, oh, you're only using aquarium co-op products. I see how it is. But if you rewind five years ago, before we ever made any products, what did I use? Linear air piston pumps, airline tubing, black airline tubing mostly, and sponge filters, right? I just tried to make each one, I tried to go, okay, can I improve upon it? I can do this little tweak, let's do that. I tried to add that to everything I touch. Um, but like linear air piston pump was as good as it gets. So there was nothing there for me to optimize. So it was mostly like, we'll carry that and make it a one-stop shop. The only thing we can really optimize is the customer support part of it and uh, you know, making it right when something goes wrong. So, all right, grab another question here. What should you do if your local fish store doesn't want all of your baby guppies? When it comes to that, I would get, well, I'm hoping you got another tank. If you got another tank, you could keep something with a little bit larger fish, maybe some killifish, maybe some uh, African dwarf frogs, maybe you're gonna keep a butterfly fish, just something bigger, and then you could move some over and let them eat them, right? You could also add some of those, like African dwarf frogs to your guppy tank and they will eat some. And you could also try like, what if I tried one, one betta in there? Eventually they get full of eating babies. Now some people can't stomach that and I, I totally respect that. Uh, but letting nature, you know, even adult guppies will eat some of their babies. So holding some food back, that's the best method I've found. And it's kind of recycling, right? So if the adult guppies are eating more of those babies, they're gonna have bigger batches. And right now they're not buying enough. But what if in three months, Right? Maybe they're like, hey, I need more guppies. I need more. Now your fish are healthier. They have more nutrition. They got more fat on the bone. Therefore, they're making more eggs, having more fish. Then you get to pay out. So uh, what, I, what I'm against personally, and half the time we get called out like, you're a your store. If you devalue your product, you start selling Craigslist, Facebook, all that, like all around that store, and maybe you're like, oh, they're a buck a piece. Now there's really no one going in that store to buy them. So now they really won't want them. So a lot of times as a breeder, unfortunately, if you overbreed something, you kind of have to eat it. 
you know, and so that might mean feeding it to another fish or whatever. Because if you just feed them all the time with food, you're going to go broke. You're like, oh, I, and that happens with angelfish breeders all the time. They're like, I've got 20,000 angels right now. It's like, dude, slow down, back up. You don't need that many. Like at any one point, you probably need 500 angelfish, right? Of various sizes, really. But, and then they'll be like, I got to unload them. I got to, they're eating so much. I'm water changing so much. I'm doing all these things so much. It's like, you don't need to pull every spawn. That's the problem here. And so, you know, if you can sell a hundred angels a month, and that would be a lot, by the way, of like one type, if you can sell a hundred angels to a store a month, if you had 500, that's five months worth. You don't need more than that. But so often they're like, I can't not pull them. It's money. And it's, it's only money when something sells. So that's the thing. It's like this airline tubing, wherever I put it on the ground, right? That airline tubing is worthless until someone will pay me for it. Right? So if, if I never sell it, it's not worth anything. So same thing, whether it's a dry good, a fish, you need you need the buyers for it. And if not, you gotta find a clever way to use it. All right. Back to some super chats. Just sort of my brine shrimp hatcher, the this one. Cannot wait to start feeding, hoping it'll help my white clouds breed. Uh yeah, so usually the extra fat content and stuff will help fish breed, but what you're really gonna notice is it's going to grow the fry. And one of the phenomenons that a lot of people run into is they don't think about, oh, my white clouds are breeding every day. And they are. They're laying eggs every day. Some are getting eaten, all that kind of stuff. That's happening every day, right? Well, if you start feeding baby brine shrimp, when those hatch out, they find a little bit of euphoria. Five days later, they're starting to eat baby brine. And you're going to find like, wait a second, I have a white cloud this big in my white cloud tank that you were never getting before. And it's just because now you're filling in. You, you kind of have all this little super tiny microfauna on everything in the aquarium. And then you come in, you might be feeding uh, like extreme nano, right? But brine shrimp is going to be the step between those. And when you're missing that step, that's when the fry die and you don't even notice. They get picked off. They're a little bit weaker. They're not enough food. Fish comes by and eats them. And when you carry them through that step onto this, that's what that brine shrimp's gonna do. So yes, it will help condition adults, but it really is great for fry and it will help in some community tanks where you're like, wow, I'm passively making fish now just because I filled in that gap. So that's what I really like brine shrimp for. And that's why I feed it to so many tanks that don't seemingly have fry. And then also I do believe this and I cannot prove it. This is Corey's wife's tale, and, and Dean believes it too. You know, we both are, you know, tinfoil hat on. We believe this. When there is brine shrimp or other tiny foods like that in the water, we believe that the fish know this and are more likely to breed. It's, it's long known in the hobby that when their food is abundant, breeding goes on. Traditional thinking is more food, more fat, more egg production, more breeding activity. That's why. We think, at least I think, that having that baby brine or, or Daphnia or Cyclops, you know, any of that live food in there really does help show them that there is a lot of food around and therefore breeding right now would be a good thing. So yes, they are eating more, but then too, there's also a great environment for when they do breed to really uh, raise those fish. So that's why I'll feed it to a lot of tanks that don't have fry. I just want, I'm feeding the adults. Feed, and with food, by the way, we're going to get nerdy about this. With food, I really wish more people would uh, think of food feeding an aquarium, not feeding fish, right? So a lot of times, you know, oh, I'm feeding the fish, but like, well, are you feeding the bacteria? Are you feeding the microorganisms that are in there? Are you feeding the snails, right, the shrimp? And so if you have a 55-gallon aquarium, even if you caught out, I caught out my three big blood parrots, right? Okay, cool. But how much bacteria is there do you want to keep alive? How many snails were in there? Was there any shrimp or anything else going on? A pleco? All of that stays in there. And in your mind, I caught the visible fish out. Food doesn't need to go in. But feeding the tank is what keeps tanks stable like in a store, right? Whether I have 300 cardinal tetras or four cardinal tetras, relatively the same amount of food goes in. Now, that's in a very extreme example, so maybe not the food goes in the same amount for four as 400, but definitely 50 versus 300, same amount of food will go in. Um, 
and that's that's how you keep it ready so that when you know you sell those out and you bring 300 from the quarantine back out it's not an ammonia cycle instantly of how do we keep up it's already used to that so that's one way to keep a very uh, uh, level tank really thank you to all the new members by the way awesome Ooh, which by the way I was thinking about that the other day we're getting close to getting to 2000 let me see I'm gonna take a look real quick to see how far are we away we have 1966, so we need, what, 34 more? No, that's not right. Yeah, 34 more. We could do that. That's technically possible in a stream. Not that we will get there, but that's technically possible. 13 or 34 out of 1,308 people, which obviously some of you already have joined, but it's doable. It technically could be done. What should I do about tiny white things swimming in my fish tank? Uh, probably nothing. Chances are some more fish will eat them without, this would be a great thing for the forum. Like if you can get a picture of it, we could identify, but little glass worms and things like that are fish food. Pretty much everything, when you think about in a lake, something there eats it. You might have a fish right now that doesn't eat it. Like if I had an Oscar, an Oscar goes like, oh, that thing? I, I, no, that's like me looking for a crumb on the floor and then going, ooh, dinner. No, but my dog, my dog, go, ooh, mm, I'm eat that, right? So you might just have to add a different size fish or maybe there's no fish. Maybe you only have uh, shrimp in there or snails, in which case any fish goes, ooh, let me eat that. So that's, that's what I would do. If it's, you think it's something nefarious there, though, post into the forum and we might be able to identify it and go from there. Uh oh, we got a guppy question and they've paid $10. So prepare yourself. Have I per personally witnessed any healthy guppy colonies nearing 80 fish in a heavily planted, filtered 20 gallon as a home hobbyist doing reasonable weekly water changes? Let me, well, yes, definitely. Uh, I need to see if I can dig up the old video, but the guy that built my store, Andy is his name, he could keep more fish than I have ever seen in very small volumes of water using live plants, some air, some filtration, barely, and water changes. And he was very gifted at it. More skill than I have. He's very in tune with nature. He owns several nurseries and, and he used to run a fish farm. But if I can find that video, you'll be shocked. You're like, there are hundreds of fish in that 10 gallon. And it would, it, it defies logic. It was super cool to look at. I loved it. I was always in love with his tanks. And uh, he would continually show me, like, pushing the limits of, like, wow, that's got to be the most I've ever seen. And uh, so, yes, I would say it can definitely be done. I have witnessed it. It's one of the, my cherished memories and one of the coolest things. And it's continually why I want to... I always want a million fish. Like, oh man, I just want more and more and more and more because they only look cooler. It looks way better the more you get. So. How do I stop my Romy Nose Tetris from eating my water wisteria? That's very interesting. I've never, I've never seen Romy Nose Tetras be uh, like om omnivorous like that and go after the plants. <sighs> I... I'm not going to say it's impossible because it's not, but I find it strange because they're considered to be an absolutely safe um, planet tank fish. Hmm. And what I, so I, I don't know how to help you with that because, I mean, maybe if it's a dying plant, they're eating some of it, but maybe increase their food, you know, get something like a, you know, baby brine or extreme nano, some flake food. Like maybe they're really hungry, but that I I just haven't seen it. And wisteria is like a pretty tough plant once it's once it's established. So, hmm. I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat, Scott, has that problem and knows how to fix it. But I have not encountered that problem. So, cherry shrimp are dying with a white ring. I just learned about KH and GH. Tap water is twenty eight. Oof, degrees hardness and 22 
uh, degrees of buffer. Can I use distilled water to lower this? Yes, you could. You can also use a reverse osmosis unit. Um, basically, if, if I had your aquarium, here's what I would do. If I was having fish die or shrimp die, and I had now just figured out like, wow, I've got crazy hard water. And I think that's the culprit. What I personally would do is I would go and buy uh, some water from the store. Now, I wouldn't just go and buy um, distilled. I wouldn't just go and buy RO from a store, like a, like a fish store. I would probably just go to a grocery store and buy, I don't know how big this tank is, but I'm going to guess it's like under 20 gallons. I would buy like a gallon or a five gallon thing of drinking water they have. Odds are when you test that water, it's gonna be way lower in parameters than what we have right now. I would then each week start doing about 10, 15% water change. So if you had a 20 gallon tank, right? Maybe you would take out two gallons, put two gallons of this other water you bought in. Now. That's going to get crazy expensive. So I don't recommend doing that forever. That's not my game plan. But my game plan is getting it down to like, okay, here's a level that is the shrimp are thriving, right? Now what I would be doing is using all the live plants. Basically, as you put food in, things are going to break down. As things break down, dying leaves, food, all that kind of stuff, it creates acids in the water. Also, plants are going to consume that calcium and other things out of the water. So over time, water typically goes down in parameters. What I'd be watching for in this aquarium is, okay, I got it to where I think is a decent level. Now let me figure out how long does it take to go down to a level I don't like. Okay, so that took a month. All right, once a month, I would probably do a partial water change, and maybe I would do one gallon um, of store-bought water and one gallon of my tap water the goal would be eventually you get it to where you can have it just be your tap water you're bringing in a little bit of that tap water it's going to be crazy high in minerals right but it'll help reset that tank and let the plants keep pulling it out and you still have a healthy shrimp population and that might take you three or four months to really dial in but then you you know how to manage it and that's that's what i like about nature is over time it will kind of self-level now if you just completely neglect it and you got it right, and then you did nothing for years, eventually it's going to get so acidic and you'll get old tank syndrome, and then you'll have stuff dying from not enough minerals, right? So you start way up here, and stuff dying from not enough minerals down there. You just want to, oh, look at that. We find this medium zone where everything's going to do okay, and that's where you want to stay. And so you might let minerals get down a little bit, then you bring some minerals in, and it kind of does this move. And then, oh, I, and then there is, okay, then I did it too soon, and then it got higher. But you're always looking to that middle zone, I think, is where I'd be trying to take a tank like that if I didn't have the optimal water conditions that I was looking for. Is adding a pea puffer to my glow light tetra tank asking for trouble? Only if you don't have another tank. Like if you had three aquariums and one's like empty, you could try it because it could work. It could also be like, why do my glow light tetras not have tails anymore? In which case, you'd want to have a backup or be willing to take it back to a store and give it back to them. Um, I would say that your odds are more like 60% trouble, 40% could work with that specific pea puffer. Um, not, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily other types of puffers, but it also depends on aquarium. If you drop that into a 125 versus a 10 gallon, like there's a lot of things going on there. What are you already feeding? Things like that. Um, can it be done? Yes. What are your odds of success? It's going to depend on that individual fish. And I've seen people like buy it. It's not working out. They give it back. And then they, you know, a month later they buy a different one. And, and eventually they do find the working combo. Like this, you know, this cat and this dog get along. Finally. Because the last one, the dog would chase the cat every time, right? But typically people fall in love with that. And they're like, well, I'm not going to get rid of my dog. I'm not going to trade it back in for one that will get along with my cat. Uh, typically they're like, well, I love this dog. And so you just keep them in different tanks. All right. Do I have any suggestions or tips on breeding emerald dwarf rasboras? I've never bred that fish. If I was going to breed them, I would breed them just like 
um, Celestial Pearl Daniel. So they're kind of a sister species. And if you haven't watched the video, by the way, Chris Lukup, the Shrimp King, did a very good video on Daniel Erythromicron that I highly recommend for the Emerald Dwarf Rasbora. Hmm. Roseline shark keeping tips. Easy mode now. It used to be hard when they were all wild caught. Now they're bred at farms. Mostly feed quality foods. Keep them in a group of six or more. Keep them in a planet tank. Keep them kind of in a 55 or larger. And those things, assuming you're a decent water keeper, you shouldn't have too many problems. Make sure they're, you know, of a decent size. You've seen them eat maybe before you buy them because they're an expensive fish, right? Um, quarantine them when you're bringing them in, all of those standard practice things, but they shouldn't be too difficult for you to keep. They're just a big money investment and uh, a great, beautiful fish long term. Death by Games with another, five, well, I don't know if it's another, but a $5 super chat. Well, thank you. If you're not a member, become a member. All right, I was wondering what your thoughts on a 30 gallon column aquarium. Fish are fun uses one, uses, wait. Fish are fun ones use a shower filter. Uh, so the column tanks, my biggest beef with a column tank is that how wide they are to lighting. So what I mean by that is like a like one of the notorious ones, like the Marineland 15 gallon. They're like two feet tall, but only like this wide. So you can get like a 10 inch or a 12 inch stingray in there. And it's really hard to get the light all the way to the bottom for plants. So that's my main beef with it. Uh, so assuming you sort the light issue out and you're like, okay, I'm getting enough light down to my plants because I, I pretty much only want plants, right? After that, I think they're fine. I think they cause a lot of uh, newer Aquarius problems when you might be reading online, you're like, oh yeah, I have, like a good example might be, I just recommended a 55 gallon or larger for those ra or, uh, roseline sharks, right? If you had a 55 gallon column tank, like let's say it was like 18 inches wide by like three feet tall by 18 inches, that would be terrible for them. Knowing that like of 55 gallon aquariums, 99% will be the standard four foot long and a 13 inches front to back, 19 inches tall. So that's my recommendation. But if you were new to the hobby and you only owned that 55 gallon column, you could be led astray and be like, oh, my rose lines are not doing well. I don't get it. Corey said they should do great. That being said, I wish Americans, myself included, would switch to, I recommend a four foot tank, right? That kind of, or a, you know, X amount of meter tank, because that is much more accurate, but it's so ingrained that I don't know that I can untrain my brain. I, I've tried and I'm, I maybe get it someday, but and, you know, it's hard to, for me, it's hard to be live, give accurate advice while trying to, even just converting liters to gallons. Like when someone's like, I got a 93 liter aquarium, I got to go, okay, well, it's like four, hold on, that's going to be like uh, 22 gallons, you know, like it's hard for me to do it. So doing it the opposite when it comes to lengths is also hard. So my brain gives up. But no, I, I think... Uh, Column tanks are just fine, knowing, you know, everything being equal. I want to change my substrate in a 75 discus tank. I bought the carob sea ready to go for plants and the fluorite. Can I put my discus right back in? Uh, yes, depending. Like, it depends on how you're going to pull this move off. So you're changing the substrate. So whatever substrate's coming out, I would siphon out with a hose. That's what I would do. Get all of that out. I would then uh, bucket your fish. I would drain the rest of the water while keeping bacteria alive on, I don't know what kind of filtration you have, with sponge filters, canister, whatever it's going to be, keeping the filtration alive. Then, well, before all of this, I would have rinsed the fluorite really well. Uh, the carob sea... Um, I'm not sure which exact product you have, but probably doesn't need rinsing. 
Well, I don't know. I I'd have to know. Maybe you rinse that, maybe you don't. I don't know. It depends on which exact care of seed product that one is. I'd have that done ahead of time in buckets. Then you put that down, then refill with water slowly so it doesn't mix it up. Now you're going to have relatively clean water. Your filtration will be alive. You put your fish back in. Maybe you don't feed for a day. Then you feed them lightly, take a day off, feed them lightly again, take a day off, feed them lightly. Let the bacteria colony make sure it's really robust again because you're going to lose all the bacteria that's on the glass. You're going to lose the bacteria that was on the substrate, but you'll keep everything that was alive in the filters as long as you kept them going during this process. The more you've prepped ahead of time, the faster it's going to be, right? So in theory, if you have all the gravels or substrates washed, you've siphoned out the substrate. Now you just keep siphoning water. Your water's this low. You net the discus really fast. You put them in the bucket. You put the new substrate in. You start filling. You might be able to get all of that done in under an hour. Um, so that's how I would approach it. Without more details, that's the best plan I can devise. If I put gravel on my super fine sand, will it stay on top or should I remove the sand? Usually uh, it will, so whatever's heaviest will go to the bottom. And usually gravel is going to be heavier than sand, so it's going to work its way down. I'm not a fan of mixing substrates just in general, but yeah, I, so usually I would start with, why do we want other gravel? If you're like, oh, I don't like the sand take the sand out. If you're trying to get that look of like, I want a rocky sand bottom, know that you're just going to have to gravel vac and kind of mix it to keep that look. Otherwise, it's just going to be gravel cells to the bottom, sand sits on top. Hello, Corey and every nerd here. Is that kind of like when you walk in a room, you're like, sup, nerds? And then if anyone, if anyone says, oh, hello, then you're like, oh, you're a nerd. I'm from South America and I do not understand feet and inches at all. Yeah, it's it's definitely difficult. I in a in a perfect world, I would be able to quote things in like centimeters, in kgs, you know, in kilograms, uh, in centigrade instead of Fahrenheit. I do try to get better at it, and I buy devices. I don't think I have any on my desk. I do try to buy devices that will show me both so that over time, like I used to not know that basically four liters was a gallon. It's close enough to do it. but So I've been able to make that mental jump, but I, th I think it's what, 2.2 centimeters to an inch, and it's, it's taken me a long time. And I think it would take me a long time. It's like learning another language, which I realize I can still read it, but it's to get on the fly. It's one thing if you're say, hey, translate this stuff or convert this stuff and I'm not in front of a camera with a bunch of people watching me, I can do it, right? But when it's do it on the fly and keep the show moving and not going, hold on, how many 2.2 kilo pounds per kilo kilogram? How much is that going to weigh? Like, like let's, let's take a real context thing, right? Okay, if I know that water weighs about eight pounds per gallon, then, well, how much water does it weigh in kilograms? Oh, uh, okay, well, it's going to be less than 4 because we know 8 divided by 2.2 is going to be less than 4. It's going to be like 3.5. And, and, and then I would Google it, right? Like how many kg does one? It wouldn't even be a gallon of water, though, because, see, that's another step. You wouldn't – it would have to be 4 liters of water weigh. Yeah, so you end up like having to convert multiple things. All right, we're going to go right here. Let's see. Yeah, the weight of one liter of water is one kilogram. Makes sense, right? So then if four liters of water is basically equal to a gallon, that's going to be four kilograms roughly, and that's the problem. It gets lost in translation because it's not exactly one or four liters to a gallon, but that would be four kilograms, right? Which would be eight point something pounds. And water is actually a little more than eight. So you get these things you can remember, and then you get the math goes off because you're already rounding. So when you round and you round and you round, you get too far off. So, so one gallon of water weighs in pounds. It weighs... 
seven one pounds. Wait, no, no, no. That's that's a lie. The answer is simple. A gallon of water weighs eight point three pounds, right? The problem is you also then get the UK measurements. So the imperial gallon of water is defined as 10.02 pounds at its maximum density, which, by the way, salt water is more dense than fresh water, uh, while the weight of US dry gallon of water is defined as 9.71 pounds. However, the answer comes with a caveat. The weight per gallon of water fluctuates with temperature. So that's, in my mind, my simple brain can remember eight pounds per gallon, right? 100 gallon aquarium, 800 pounds. 800 gallon aquarium, 6,400 pounds. Is that right? No. 600, yeah. 6,400 6, pounds. I think that's right. See, I always question myself the minute I'm in front of, when you're in front of a thousand plus people, they're going to call you out on it. I double, like, oh wait, eight times uh, 800. Yeah, 6,400, 6,400. That's what I said. You always do, like, it's something in front of being in a crowd. You always second guess yourself, like, I'm going to be dumb in front of that many people. I better question myself, even though I know I know it. All right. If your water's maxed out on GH and KH in the test kit and was 8.4 pH out of the tap, what are a few fish you would love to keep? Uh, every live bear, all African cichlids. Um, you could also get into, like, African tetras and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, snails... Live bears, African cichlids, and really, you've just described my entire fish room. Like, I, I, I sound, or I would be in heaven for that water. Java Moss, best way to sell and ship? Uh, usually, you sell it by the clump. Part of it is having really good pictures of, like, how big is this while clumped? How big is it while not clumped up in an aquarium? Um, I would just ship it in a bag, honestly. And you want to ship it the day, like you want to pack it that day. Don't pack it so that you let it sit around for a few days or it's smelling funky. So, you know, double bag it basically. You can even Ziploc bag it. That's been done a bunch. Uh, label everything really well. You ship it out and uh, should be good mostly. Don't let any duckweed get in there. Thank you for the info on the white things. Could you tell me about what, oh wait. I do about my plants. Hold on. My brain cannot keep up with multiple subjects in one sentence today. Thank you for the info on the white things. Could you tell me what can I do about my plants getting on route? It by my quarry and my snails. Okay, I gotta, I gotta, I'm sure you guys saw the super chat too. I gotta dissect it. So the white things, could you tell me about what I can do about my plants getting on route, on route it by my quarry, my sin? Maybe getting eaten? I feel like there's an autocorrect error here that is, I'm going to scroll down. Maybe someone's, maybe you're saying, oh, it meant to say this. What do I do about my plants getting on route? Getting around it? I don't know, eaten? I don't know. I don't know what you're trying to say, but if they're eating it, usually corridors wouldn't eat it. Snails could eat it. If the plant's already dying, that can happen. Um, they'll eat debris um, or debris. Upping food usually tames. Uh, oh, uprooted. Getting uprooted. Okay. Now, see, someone figured it out for me. Good. What to do about my plants getting uprooted by my corridors and my snails? Okay. So that you could use a couple of different products or techniques. First, I'm going to give you the uh, free one. Get some rocks, right? Maybe you got some stones in your yard or something, and you can put that at the base of the plant so that you've got your plant here and you've got some rocks around it. And now they can't get to where the plant is, right? That's a common trick we use for uh, goldfish and things like that. The other thing you could do you could um, use something like plant weights. I don't think I have any near me, but depending on the plant, you could weigh them down so they won't get uprooted as much. The other thing you could do, time to pay some bills again. <laughs> you could use a easy planter, and if you had your plant in the pot, you could put it in there. 
Now it's sitting here. Your corridors are down here doing their thing. Snails are all around. They're not going to get uprooted. That's a good thing. Uh, you could also just use that pot. So one of the things you could do is use the pot you get a plant in and put lead weights, or you can take the basket off, put a heavy rock in the bottom, put it back together, and that'll keep it mostly in place. Uh, but it's still not as sturdy as you know something like that or uh, putting the rocks directly around it to prevent them from being able to dig right next to it. So there you go. Let's see, does someone text me that? Yeah, candy gut. It's uprooted. It's hard. I, I, I probably would get some pleasure watching other people decipher stuff in front of a crowd because it's, it's a nerve-wracking thing of like, brain don't work right now. What do people watching? You can like see the gears turning. Ugh. All right. Got a 29-gallon with six cardinal tetras, four rummy nose. I can't get my ammonia to get to zero. I'm running a canister and a sponge filter. I'm lost. So the first thing you should know, make sure that it's not a conflict with your test kit and your dechlorinator. So things like Prime Dechlorinator or I believe also like the Fritz Complete. By the way, I haven't talked about this product in a long time. It's amazing. It's got the pump head. It's basically, it's Prime except one squirt treats 10 gallons. Love this stuff. But what can happen with like an API test kit and certain other ones, I think Salifert and, and a few other test kits, the dechlorinator breakdown process and all that causes false positives of the ammonia test kit. So that could be the first thing you're dealing with. So make sure, because that's real common when people go, I don't get it. Everything's right except ammonia is not right. Because usually if you have ammonia and it's an established tank, you'll have um, some ammonia, but also some nitrite. If it's just ammonia, that's where I'm like, ooh, what's going on there? So look into that. Now, what could be going on besides that is like, did you disrupt your bacteria? Are you changing too much water? Are you testing right after you put new water in and you had chloramine and then you broke the bond with a dechlorinator and now you actually do have ammonia. That's one of the processes. You're going to end up with some ammonia, but your filter is going to process that. Um, now, I want to address the 29 gallon with just six cardinals and four rummy nose. The amount of fish doesn't really uh, affect how much ammonia you should or shouldn't have, right? So whether you have a five gallon bucket, when you have a, a, you know, a 20 gallon aquarium, it takes a little bit of waste to get ammonia to start registering, right? And so when we talk about feeding the tank versus feeding fish, whether you have a hundred fish in there or five fish, if you put a cube of blood worms in there, it's gonna show ammonia if it's not cycled, right? So I would just make sure that we're not going, oh, I've got 100 gallons of water, I've got 29 gallons of water and very few fish. I don't have to worry about ammonia. That's not true at all. Like you still have to worry based on the amount of food you put in. So, um, but hopefully I think it's probably gonna be that false positive kit for you. And then you'll go, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about it at all, great. I saw the rare yellow white clouds in your video recently and instantly wanted to breed them in my pond this summer. Will you be getting any again? I don't know. Uh, Robert will will bring them in for sure because I want some. I haven't moved any fish to the new building yet. I want to play with them also. I think they look good. I'll be trying it, but sometimes, you know, and that's, that's what plagues us with Aquarius when you see that fish and you don't see it again and you didn't know, like, this was the only time I was going to see it. Usually you'll see things again, but like my ellipsifer eel that I had, or I have, I had one, he, his back got bit in half by Hank accidentally originally. It took me eight years to find another one. And I looked, you know, probably at least once every three months, but there's times when I look every week and then I forget about it and then I look again and it's because it's a wild caught eel from Lake Tanganyika. For many years, they weren't exporting really anything out of Lake Tanganyika. And so, but now that I have it, it's even more sweet, right? Like, oh, it took me eight years to get you back. That's why it's going to be one of my pets, because I really like it. Um, you know, they only get like this big. They stay like that big around. Not kind of fire eel size. It's ungodly. All right. I have a grommy that's growing black fluffy fungus looking, looking thing on its back. Huh. 
I don't know that I've seen black fungus. Um, as far as treating it goes, whenever I run into something, I don't know what it is, two options hit me. Either the trio or salt. If you don't have plants, I for sure go with salt. Because salt just, man, it gets so much stuff. Because we don't know with this black fungus, right? I have no idea if like Marison and Ickex combo is going to beat that for you. Salt will get dang near everything. It's so versatile. So if I didn't have live plants or I had a quarantine tank, I would use, I would choose salt first, actually. Then, if you didn't have... Ooh, I saw... The light went red. Big super chat. I'll address in a little bit there when I get to it. Thank you. Uh, but if you got the meds on hand, use the meds. If you don't have the salt and you got the plants and you have to do it, do that. But I, I think salt being the cheaper thing here and the better thing is how I would how I would uh, tackle it. Smallest fresh water to keep in a 120-gallon tank? Ask Philip. Well, there's two answers. There is the answer the internet wants you me to say, and that is 120 gallon is too small to ever keep any ray ever. How dare you? And then there is, okay, Corey, besides that, what would be the best ray for me to get in my 120 gallon that I can actually get, be cost effective, I'll buy a tank in the future and upgrade, don't worry about it, bro, type of answer. And then it would be a teacup platy is going to be the most readily available one you get them for 150 bucks or less you can kind of get your chops on that one learn how to feed them learn how to protect them from getting a heater burn managing their ammonia all of that kind of stuff making sure you don't put them with plecos most of the time making sure you got the right substrate those are going to be the most common that you could walk into a store and that they might have readily eating if you're going to get one make sure you see it eat before you get it and then there's going to be you know the internet's going to come back like, that's not the smallest ray. That's not, you know, it's like, well, sure. There's going to be these rare rays that are much more expensive, you know, that are hard to get. Like someone might argue, well, Matoro is going to be better. Like, yeah, maybe. But, you know, you could, if you had either one, a Matoro or uh, a teacup, you know, reticulated, they're considered beginner rays, which, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, I'm going to do some beginner brain surgery. Like, well, it's not really beginner. Like that, that's rays are kind of an advanced thing. And it's just because they have all these quirks about them that are a pain in the butt. They can be very rewarding if you love them. Um, I find them to be too much work based on my enjoyment level for them. And so that's my answer is I would get a teacup, which they're not that small. You're going to see them. And so another thing to know when you see them and they're this big, they might literally only be like three weeks old. Like they come out of their live bear, Steen Rays are live bear, they come out big already, that big. So it's not like, oh, they grew this up. Like it's it's a pretty young fish. Um, but I would go with one of those two routes. That's what we'll bring into the store typically is Matoro or a, a reticulated. And we spend most of the time convincing people not to buy one until you get those diehards that have really been looking and they seem like they've really done the research and then and then usually you find out nine months later, you're like, yeah, it died. Like, oh, dang it. Dang it. But then there's the people that like, you know, really do well with it and love it. And and it's, I've had it for six years and it's amazing. And my whole family loves it. And that's why you continue to do it because there are those success stories out there. And who am I to be the gatekeeper of a fish? That's the thing is, you know, at a certain point you go, okay, you've got as good odds as you're going to get keeping this thing alive. There you go. I've done my pushback of maybe it's not a great pet maybe it's not in a great situation maybe 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 and if you check all the boxes yep i'm ready yep i'm ready yep 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 all right then please hand me your 140 dollars i'll be here when you have more questions i will do my best to help you from this point forward all right i placed an order that was supposed to arrive on the 20th but it hasn't arrived and the tracking has not updated since the 19th. Should I be contacting USPS? Uh, you could, Grace. What they're going to tell you is deal with it in a nice way. They're going to be like, hey, weather, delays, COVID, lots of packages, wait for it. And then if we do it, they're going to say the same thing. What I think actually matters here is if you have live plants, right? 
The hope is that they will arrive in, in good condition. Plants can last a very long time in transit. You know, we we have shipments that are in transit basically out of a tank for over 10 days when we're ordering them from another country, then they land, then they got to go through customs, and they finally get to us. Now, I think the path of leech resistance for you, Grace, is give it a few more days, you know? Uh, after that, like, like, what's today? Today is Wednesday. Maybe on, like, Friday or Saturday, if it hasn't arrived, you email us and go, hey, it hasn't arrived. And then we go, okay. And then we'll look at the order and be like, oh, it's, if it's dry goods only, let's give it a few more days. Um, if it's got live plants in it, we'll go, okay, well, whew, prob- odds are probably not going to, we'll reship it, right? We kind of look at that and go, okay, uh, we'll reship Monday. Let me know if it's not there by Monday. Uh, but then there's there's special situations sometimes where you go, hey, I got meds in that order. My fish are sick right now. I really, really need these. And then we go, okay, we, we'll, we'll ship them out tomorrow. Sorry about that. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll have a situation like that one that like got delayed by a month and then the guy super chatted us, which we're thankful for. But we do know that there's going to be extraneous situations that we just got to deal with as a business. So, but I would say you reaching out to USPS usually doesn't do anything. Now, if you saw that it said attempted delivery wasn't home and you knew you were home, then I would be telling you, hey, call your local postmaster and say, hey, look. You got my package somewhere. I need my package. And we can't call for you because we call and they'd be like, cool, customer's got to call. And then that basically lets them know, I was here. Someone just signed the paper that said, I wasn't home. I was here. Deliver it tomorrow, please. That's about the best you can hope for, which is, it's unfortunate that that's where we are right now. But, you know, a lot of things in the world have changed. And I do think... Lots of people are trying to make things better, and I do think it will get better over time. People are getting hired. uh, Processes are getting changed. All these things are going on, and we're just all kind of weathering the storm the same way. So uh, rest assured, that's the one thing I always would like to follow up with. Rest assured that you've paid us for product. We will make sure that you get that product. You know, I can't guarantee, you know, like if there's a hurricane going on right there, I can't guarantee you're going to have it tomorrow, but as soon as it makes sense, that product will be in your hands and you'll be enjoying them uh, as soon as shipping will allow it, basically. All righty. Would you suggest adding, wait, what would you suggest adding to a 55 gallon with nine leopard longfin danios, 10 pearl danios, 20 quarries? I'm running some aqua clear 70s, two large sponge filters. And it's planted. Oof, you could add about anything in there. Um, you know, obviously it comes back to what do you like to look at? You could do all of that. Um, but I would, you know, I would look at it and go, what would I, I like the I like the active tank you got going there. For me personally, I would be going crazy on Danios. I'd be getting uh, leopard blue Danios. I'd be getting uh, some zebras in there. I'd be getting... Um, some like, ki- ki- wait, I can't even say it right now on live stream. Kyathit Danios, uh, Daniel Chorpre, because that tank's going to be really active and you can just pile on the food, right? And then down below, you got all those Corys eating it all. So that's, a, I like a really active tank like that. And with that many plants and that much filtration, you can kind of go crazy. And why I chose those fish is because it's not unreasonable to be like, I'd grab 20 zebras. I'd grab 20 uh, leopard blue danios. I'd grab 20, you know, because they're cheap enough. Now, some of them are a little more expensive, and you're probably not going to grab 20, but you can have these big numbers. That tank is going to be really active, and I find it to be very enjoyable. You could definitely add some showpiece fish. Like, maybe you're going to go, oh, I'm going to add a pearl garami, or I'm going to add this or that. Um, But I like big numbers, and I think it looks cool. So that's what I that's what I go for. That one guy says I finally caught a live stream. Well, don't worry. Use some notifications. Set up the the you know the buzzers and the bells and it's gotta. Be, I need that. I need like a DefCon thing going on. Like you know when a submarine dives. I need that when the live stream's happening. I gotta hire that out. Get Jimmy to make it or find someone that can. That can be my intro of like, you know, what is it like Hunt of 
I don't know, Red October, the submarine. I need like that. Oh man, Jack with another five dollar super chat. My autocrat messed me up. Unrooted. Well, thank you very much. Glad we got to the bottom of that. Um, yeah. Hopefully you're already a member because that costs you an extra five bucks. It hurts. It hurts a little bit. Really, I just want people to be members. You know, like I want the income, but I want the income in the least or in the most rewarding way possible. That's my my goal. Just take it and keep doing what you're doing, Nikki Foo Foo. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the hundred dollars. I will funnel that straight into something productive. I don't know what that will be yet, but I try to have most things be productive. And so, yeah. In your mind, go. What do I want to see? Yeah, it's that. What's my holy grail fish that I've never gotten to own? There's not too many. I really think some of the really cool um, Chana Chana, right? I'm, I'm like brain farting the normal name. They don't call them just bowfins, do they? That's like the sister species. Snakeheads, there we go. Uh, some of those crazy colorful ones. I don't even know if it's only just like breeding colors or what, but that's kind of on my, like, wow, that'd be cool. Like, they're not legal, but that's that's on my, that'd be super cool list. Uh, for me, mostly, the Holy Grail fish is actually fish that I already like, but that I could go collect myself or view in the wild. So, like, I've been very fortunate in being able to keep keep most fish I've ever been interested in. However, like my mind would be blown seeing a Mabu puffer in the wild, like just interacting with its surroundings. And, and until, until you've gone and seen aquarium fish in the wild, you can't really connect your brain to how awesome it is and how much it changes the way you think about keeping that fish and all of that. And so just not even, you know, you can see pictures and videos. It's not the same. When you're there, when you're there, it opens up this whole new avenue of like, I'm doing it all wrong. Look at this. Look at that. Wow. Who would have known? And because uh, a lot of times it's people doing on, like, on expeditions and things like that. They're doing it. And not so much like a hobbyist going, huh, who knew? There's like 40 Gatorade bottles floating around here. And like, oh, that, look at that one. Stuck inside one. Like you got the garbage element. You got... How much mulm is there? Like, what other fish are there? Like, how spooked is it? How outgoing is it? All of that kind of stuff. So that's really, you know, there's there's fish I I want to collect in the wild, and I want that, like, wow, I went and saw it. I collected it. I'm breeding it. I'm, you know, selling it or whatever. There is still, like, some rice fish are on that list. There's some very mottled, cool-looking rice fish that I want. But I same thing. I kind of want to go to Japan and like get some eggs and bring them back. Like if they showed up tomorrow on Aquabit or something, I would buy them. But, um, my Holy Grail fish at this point is usually stuff I didn't know existed. Like, uh, seeing black rams in person in, in Israel, um, seeing they had a really cool, like panda angel fish. That was pretty cool. I don't need to own it, but seeing the stuff that I don't know exists, is really cool. Uh, the Vienna guppies, I really fell in love with that fish. I ended up bringing them back, but yeah, it's on my holy grail list, although I didn't know it existed before. But when I saw it, I was like, I have to have this. What can I do? I will do anything for this fish, right? Uh, and then I would also add to that holy grail fish, but with success, right? So like the ellipse for eel, I had had it before. It was very high on my list, but I want to keep it again longer, more than like a year, and have it not get killed basically by a puffer and then in that category would be um Sulawasi cardinal shrimp i've kept them going for about a year i was never never really to get them to breed which i just thought of by the way my new water should be at least more mineralized i might have a much better chance of getting cardinal shrimp they are i'll, I'll even pull that i'm going to pull that one up just so you guys can see how awesome cardinal shrimp are they're pretty much the best thing ever. These right here are cardinal shrimp. They've got these little white legs, and when they're eating, they look like they're dancing the whole time. If Dean, if you're listening, we 100% got to make one of the tanks. 
cardinal shrimp. I have to do it. I have to do it. They're so good. I'm doing it. I'm I'm probably gonna kill them on camera. That's gonna suck, but I'm gonna do it because I've been I've been jonesing after keeping cardinal shrimp and breeding them. And the last time I had tried, they were all wild caught and they were crazy expensive and a lot less was known about them. And so this time I, I, I've got to have a better chance at it. Got to. Got better water for it too. So, yeah. Alternate theory of Renekii are the plants that I was talking about and they're the only ones getting uprooted. All right. So, yeah, you got a stem plant there. Uh, it's hard to put lead weights around just the base of them because they'll rot out. One one trick I got for you, Jack, is I don't have any way to explain this. This is your stem plant, right? And you got leaves coming off it. A lot of times when you get it, maybe it comes in a pot. It could be a little bit mushy down there, or maybe it doesn't have any roots at all yet. Or maybe you have some and you're going to clip them. And now you got these stems. Well, what do you do with those stems? One of the best things you could do is let it float around your tank. Right? It'll be right next to the light. Here's your light. This is what lights do, by the way. They, oh, look, light. They do that. They get the jazz hands out, and they sprinkle it right on your plant. What does that do? That allows it to uptake nutrients, and then it's going to grow roots. Now, roots look like this. Close to jazz hands. When they're above and move, that's light. Down below, these are roots, just so you know. Now you got all these roots and you got this really ugly looking uh, plant because it looks like a pen. But it's got all these roots coming out, right? Now those roots, the good news is when you finally go to plant this and it's got all these roots all over the place, when you stick it into the substrate, some of those roots are going to be able to actually take hold and help hold it down. So that's one other tip I have too, especially if you have a real sorry looking plant that's barely holding on, getting it floating right around the, the jazz hands gives it that little bit of a boost it needs. And then as long as you don't have like too many aqua clears and it's just like, oh God, it's hanging on for its life. Gentle flow right up near the jazz hands does wonders for a plant like that. Especially you're going to get a lot of reds and purples out of that probably because it's a highlight plant really likes it. All right. All right. Jack became a member. Finally. Woo. Got him. Can end the show. No, he's, you've been very gracious with the amount of super chats, and uh, I'm glad you became a member because, yeah. All right. How come it isn't talked about with ammonia versus pH versus ammonium? Is it actually different bacteria? Uh, no, actually, none of those are bacteria, but I'll, I'll talk about it. I recently had super low pH, and the cycle completely died. The fish lived, and they were fine. So... When you get below 6.4 pH, you get ammonium. It changes the, well, let me preface this. I'm not a science nerd. I'm gonna butcher this. I know how it works, but I am going to trigger chemists hard with my definition. So bear with me. With a low pH of 6.4 or lower, Ammonia changed to, changes to ammonium. Compound changes slightly somehow. I don't know. Nerds probably look at it and it changes. What I need to know or what you need to know is in that form, it is way, way less toxic. So much so that it technically is not even harmful for fish. Now, maybe at some super high level or maybe at some level we haven't figured out yet, but in theory, not harmful. Okay. When the pH goes above that, it then changes back to ammonia and becomes very harmful, right? Now, it's still ammonium, and I believe bacteria still eats it. How do you spell it? Ammonia. Let's see if it still works. Uh, that's part I would have to actually look up to whether nitrosomus and nitrobacteria uh, would eat it. I believe, I think it still processes it. Cause, so the way I know it to work, the problem is I only run like planet tanks, but plants will still consume it. I believe bacteria still breaks it down. Part of the problem you run into is when your pH gets too low, bacteria no longer survives. 
So if it gets so acidic, no longer will uh, bacteria survive. So it sterilizes that. The other problem you could run into is that at low enough pH, you actually get pH burn on fish. It'll start melting away, it burns through the slime coat, and you'll actually get burns on the fish. Now, how does this really apply to most people? Because most people won't have that super acidic of water, won't have all these problems. You see it often in fertilizers. So we have the Easy Green Fertilizer, right? Now, ours does not contain ammonia. So there are a lot of people that will say, like, this other fertilizer is much more potent. That is true. Ours, however, doesn't contain ammonia. A lot of more potent fertilizers, like even miracle Grow, that kind of stuff, right? But aquatic fertilizers will contain ammonia. Now, the premise is, so long as the pH stays low, it will be ammonium and therefore not toxic to the fish. The problem becomes when someone takes that fertilizer, right? They take some easy green and they go, I'm gonna put that in my aquarium. And maybe you put it in your highly aquascaped aquarium with CO2 and all of that and your plants go wild and it looks amazing. Then you walk over to your guppy tank, right? And you squirt some in there. You might have, and I say might because you won't always, but you might have some adverse reactions on how much you dose because now it will be ammonia going in, right? And you can see this play out also when you use like an ADA or an enriched soil like fluval stratum and all of that. They help buffer the pH lower. That's good because they do release a lot of ammonia also, so it keeps it in a non-toxic form. So why don't people kind of talk about that more? I believe it's because it's hard enough a lot of people really struggle with pH, GH, KH, and just parameters in general. And then to add on, oh, this change is based on this other one. Like, I can't even keep that straight. And so it's usually a higher level topic. Um, it comes up a lot more when shipping fish and doing that. So like a lot of times you have a lot of ammonia in a bag, right? You get some fish in the mail. If there's a lot of ammonia, typically you also would have a lot of carbon or CO2, which will lower the pH in the bag. So in that bag at this moment, you might have a pH of six, ammonia through the roof, and lower oxygen levels. The minute you open that bag, you allow oxygen exchange, you might have it where that pH shoots back up, and now that ammonia is very toxic. So a lot of times with saltwater shipments and some other shipments you know, of delicate stuff, you basically open the bag, add prime directly to help bond that ammonia, and then you can drip acclimate. This is also why we don't do any acclimation with fish. We basically open up a bag, pour them into a net, put them into a tank. So they go from 6.0, or I mean, that's extreme situation. When we test it, mostly it's, it's more like uh, the fish are gonna go from about a 7.2 buffer, because a lot of transship fish and that kind of stuff get buffered before they're shipped. They don't run into that scenario of pH burns and things. Uh, but they basically go from a 7.2 straight into a net with no water. Then that net straight into our aquariums, it might be 7.0. Uh, and we find that that is a lot less stress and much higher survival rates than trying to drip acclimate when you have meds and lower pHs and uh, ammonia in the water. So I hope I've done that topic uh, some justice because that's not commonly talked about as you've referenced and it can be a little bit complex and there's still, you know, some more weird scenarios probably to talk about when it comes to that. But uh, for the most part, I think it covers it enough. $5 towards Master Dean's new DeWalt drill. Well, he did get a drill, so good news. We even drilled another hole with that drill and it didn't burn out. All right. Alrighty, JR with a $5 super chat. Well, thanks, JR. I second easy potassium. The problem is, the more you uh, diversify a line, so you let's say we have of the 1,400 people watching, let's say we have 300 of you that want uh, easy potassium. Well, that's 300 out of like, oh, we're gonna sell 7,000 bottles of Easy Green, but the other 6,700 people don't need more potassium. And the problem is you will now get 1,000 emails going, well, which ones do I need? I thought Easy Green was an all-in-one. It's like, well, it does have potassium, but if you need more, 
And we already have that problem with easy iron, right? And so I, I think, I'm not gonna say it could never come out in the future, but we need the best marketing campaign, the best videos, the best blog articles to help people realize, okay, you may need more potassium if your plants are showing the deficiency. Could you buy easy potassium? Yes. Could you increase maybe some types of food you're feeding and doing other things to hit that balance also? Yes. And then you also need to know like, okay, well, how fast is potassium going to be taken up with this type of plant versus that type of plant? Because they'll use different amounts of potassium. And then once you do potassium, instantly the next one is like, I need easy phosphate, another macro, right? It's like, okay, well, and so it leads you down this rabbit hole of pretty hard to get to the bottom of. Now, we are developing some other products. Some stuff is going to work with each other a little bit. But it's a delicate thing because you kind of keep going down the nerm hole and, you know, how much phosphate's in your water? How much potassium's going to be in your water? How much is leaching out of this? How much is that? And you get to a point where you almost have made an impossible scenario. Like our goal is easy, not harder. And the more steps we start adding, right, at the point where we're like, well, we have seven fertilizers. Why, why isn't it just dry ferts or Seachem's line or another product's line? Um, we, we engineer products. So how do we help the majority of people the easiest, knowing that there's going to be corner case outliers and there's going to be these things that it's not worth, if we're able to help the majority, uh, watering down something to help a minority. And it sucks to be in the minority, trust me. I know that. Um, so I do work on things of like, how can we supplement? How can we get better information out there? It's not lost on me, by the way. I do know that, you know, more potassium. And if you go through the years, by the way, if you look at what's in Easy Green, you'll notice we up the potassium by a lot, right? But if you go too far, now you've got way too much potassium in aquariums and phosphates in aquariums. You run into like, okay, this, every time I dose Easy Green, I just make algae. You got to remember that there are people that are going to have one Anubius and they're like, oh, I'm squirting it in. And there are going to be people that have crazy high end setups going, I pour it all in, it's still not enough. And you got to service everyone in between. And if the goal is easy, you need it to come out of a squirt bottle. It's got to be kind of an all in one. If the goal is best dialed in nutrients, like, well, there's better ways to approach that. Make your own dry ferts you know, whatever you're going to do and test all those, all those things all the time. But most people, myself included, I want to be like, yeah, I put some fertilizers in, I get good growth. I'm happy with that. I, I can tweak it a little bit if I want to get more pinks or more reds. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with that. By the way, just buy our root tabs. Yeah, we've got phosphate in there. You could supply more phosphates or ph phosphate, more potassium to your plants through the root structure if you wanted to. So that's kind of one of those like, well, you could do you could do this with that product too, but we don't talk about that because it does go down the rabbit hole of like, well, how many root tabs do I need for my plant? Well, are you running out of this? Are you running out of that? Is it a water column feeder, root feeder? What's going on? What's happening? All right, we've been going for a while now, haven't we? I gotta keep keep mushing on. 20 gallon fish, wait, 20 gallon fish that can manage guppy fry yet leaves guppy adults alone. Rams and apistos? Uh, you could probably do something like a uh, Bolivian ram. Uh, otherwise I would do like an African dwarf frog or um, trying to think of the right killifish fish maybe. Maybe a, what, in 20 gallons? Yeah. Maybe a Bolivian Ram. That's probably what I would do. I would see how it goes. Best plants for a discus tank? How do you get rid of black beard algae? Uh, we've got a lot of articles written on algae. We also have videos written on algae. My first step is go there. I'm going to tell you how to do it, but this is a very quick, version of something you should do more research. Basically, I would use a combination of something like Siamese algae eaters or another fish that can eat it. 
mix that with um well maybe not mix but you could also use a chemical treatment which i don't know if i'm a fan of is it harmful no it is technically not harmful at all in fact it's beneficial to your aquarium so some people like the way it looks some people don't like the way it looks on just a, a normal level it is beneficial as far as plants that do best in a, a discus tank it depends on temperature uh but a lot of sword plants do really well almost there's a lot of plants that can do well but sword plants typically do well um i'm just trying to think of how to honestly answer that like almost any plant i can grow in a discus tank depending but if you're at 90 degrees like okay it's gonna be a lot harder than at 82 at 82 anything right but okay 85 86 like okay a lot of swords you know micro sword amazon sword melon sword anything with sword in the name is pretty much going to work but copas typically will handle it. it it becomes in that zone of like 84 to 86 it's like well you need to try it because that high temperature is going to be a stress factor right and so if you have one stress factor, then, well, how good is your lighting? How good is your CO2? How good is your fertilizer? If you've got too many stress factors, the plant won't make it. But if you had CO2, good lighting, good fertilizer, and 84 degrees, almost any plant will be like, well, I don't love the 84, but I'll keep growing. I'll, I'll make it. All right. Since we're talking about potassium and ferts, any thoughts regarding sodium from using softened water? I have a well with a water softener. I have not, uh, ha I don't have firsthand experience. What I do know is I've had a lot of customers over the years have a lot of problems with uh, basically the salt in water softeners, like making it harder for plants. So I think that's the, the NACL that's in there where, yeah, you're going to have you know, sodium and, and, and there might be some other elements in there, but in general, what we find works is find hopefully an outside, uh, like spigot or something that you can get water from that isn't going through the softened water that usually just runs, runs into problems. And I don't have a ton of, uh, you know, I don't have a ton of experience with it outside of other customers. So when you're diagnosing something through like a third party, it's hard to go, well, did it fix it or would it have been fixed anyway? Hmm. In my 20 gallon, I've got six blue neon stripe tetras, six rummy noses, six emperor tetras, six snails, 12 shrimp, four guppies, two long skirt tetras, two pleco cats, four white corridoras, two banded coolie loaches. Do I have too many in my tank? Uh, let me just do... 6, 12, 18, 24. I mean, it's definitely quite a bit. Now, if we had that tank at the store, it would look normal. Like, yeah, there's a lot of fish. They're not going to live here their whole lives. We'll be selling them off. We have auto water change, a lot of stuff going on. In your specific instance, I would say I would test the water. So if your water parameters are looking great and all the fish are happy and you're happy, it's probably okay for now. Now, I don't know what type of plecos you have, but if they're going to get larger, let's say they're already this big, they may, if they're bristlenose, maybe they get that big, right? Or maybe if they're commons, they're going to get huge. I, I will say that a cursory look at that many fish, it looks like you're pretty heavily stocked. If water tested out well, who's to say you're in the wrong? If water was bad, you might go, okay, I got to pull the food back a little bit. I got to make some changes. Maybe I got to upgrade. Um, but usually I don't want to tell people how to run their hobby other than look into the metrics. What is the water looking like? Do you enjoy it? Is your family enjoying it? If the answer is great water and you enjoy it, you're doing okay for now. If that changes two months down the road, then you know I need to make a change, right? All righty. How many fish can I keep in a five gallon tank? It's an open-ended question. It's kind of like saying, how many chips can you eat? Well, there's like, how many could you physically eat, which is a lot, and how many should you eat, which is probably not nearly as many. It also depends on what kind of chips. You know, if you're going to eat 42 pounds of jalapeno chips, you might be on the toilet for a week and a half. If you're just eating 
like a handful of tortilla chips, like, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's the same thing with fish. Like one, six, 22, like are we talking this big a fish? I would say to, to give you a reasonably useful answer, start light, you know, do research. Like we've got recommendations and videos and things like that for nano fish, for nano tanks. You might keep one pea puffer if you're a solo fish guy. You might keep uh, a group of uh, 11 uh, Bridgetate Rasmoras if you're looking for that schooling look. You might keep shrimp instead. You might have it fully planted. Maybe you don't. Maybe you keep one better. It's a really hard question to answer when you go, how many chips should someone eat? Like, all right, how about, well, the average person probably eats like half a bag. They're going to say they eat a handful, but they eat half a bag. And then, you know, you kind of get that next thing where it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, they're uh, three months old. Like, okay, none. <laughs> you know, so the more details you get, like, okay, it shapes it a little more. Like, ooh, how experienced are you? You know, that's that three-month thing. Like, oh, not very experienced? Maybe you shouldn't be, you know, taking a half bag of jalapeno chips down. My aquarium plants are secreting cobweb-looking attachments and the leaves are turning brown at the tips. So this is one of those things that either it's exactly what you're saying is happening, in which case I've never seen that before, or what you're describing is like, oh yeah, you've got some plants that might be dying back and you've got maybe some staghorn algae growing on it. Because I've seen it before where I'm like, oh yeah, it's a staghorn algae, blah, blah, blah. And then I see a picture, I'm like, wow, you literally have like this cobweb stuff secreting out of the plant leaf. Never seen that before. So being that I've never seen that before, I can't really help you a whole lot with that if that's what's going on. But if it's just algae and um, some brown leaves, you might have some deficiencies going on. Look into a plant deficiency guide. We've got them. We've got videos on it, that kind of stuff. You know, at the basic, good light for your plants. Uh, also some good fertilizer. They should be growing you might be like oh well, my plants are growing great but this i just have leaves that do that like that is something different i don't know the answer to that one but i will treat it like uh it's just algae all right i just got shocked by a 500 watt aquarium heater less learned lesson inspect heaters before putting them in your tank yeah i mean that's you know it's kind of like look at your food before you eat it good idea to be aware uh i will say I think, in general, the fact that a 500-watt heater even exists is stupid. Uh, I'm really a big fan of less is more here. I think people use way too much wattage. Um, and even if you needed 500 watts, I would much prefer to have five 100-watt heaters to spread the risk. One goes bad and sticks on, takes longer to overheat your tank. If one stops coming on, you've got four to make up the difference. Um, with one 500 watt heater, the minute it goes, you're either going to drop in temperature really fast or you're going to heat really fast. Now you might tell me, well, it's for a swimming pool, you fool. Like, okay, sure. But in average aquariums, like even in this aquarium, I was only running like 300 Watts in an 800 gallon aquarium. Now I get it. We're heating the room also, but you know, by the time you factor in pumps, lights, and heaters, there's a lot of heat going on. And you know, a lot of people will buy a heater based on, like, I think I need a big heater because I got a big tank. And then you watch it turn on and off all day long. The reality is you only need to go past a 100-watt heater if it had to stay on 24-7. And most people never run into that. There are people with, you know, basement tanks and garage tanks where it's like, yep, it's on 24-7 and can't keep up. The average person in their home where they're comfortable at being a temperature and they've got a lid on the tank and certain things that will help, a 100 watt heater will handle very large tanks. Like, I don't think, besides this tank, which they're turned off by the way, besides this tank, I don't think I have a heater bigger than 100 watts in use in my, in my fish room. Now at the store, we might have a couple of 200 watt ones in like uh, discus tanks and stuff, but a lot of times we'll have them around because we were testing them, because we know when we bring heaters on, people are going to buy that 300 watt, the 200 watt, all of that, knowing that people only need the 100 watt. But we better test them and make sure they work so that, because there's that whole mentality, bigger is better. I want to really have more than not enough. And so we need to make sure that we're not selling a product that would be dangerous 
at that level. But yes, I've been shocked. It's not fun. More mostly like uh than it is like dangerous from the shocks I've had, luckily. Uh but that's just my rant on giant heaters. Cause you go to you go to these shows and they're like, We have a two thousand watt heater, like why? Why? No one, no one on this planet needs a two thousand watt heater. You know? Or you'll find manufacturers they start at five hundred. It's like, no. They're trying to they're trying to blend the line of like, but we could sell it to aquaponics and we could sell it to Aquarius. Like, nope, nope, make it for the aquarium hobby. It'll be much smaller. I planted a three gallon tank for my apartment. What fish do you recommend that are friendly with shrimp but will stay small? Uh, you could watch, we've got nano tank. We did a three gallon tank about the store. Uh, we've got that video. Um, it's hard for me to recommend anything in three gallon because it's purely experience based. If you're, I'm, I'm always conflicted of like, if you're asking what fish to put in, a lot of times that's for a newer aquarist because people that are veterans in the hobby, they already know what they want to go in there. So I'll just say the fish that I would keep in there because at my skill level, what would Corey enjoy in a three gallon? I think that's the fairest answer I can give. Uh, I would do a school of Brigitte Rasboras because I think they look amazing. They're a relatively small fish. And I would probably keep far too many, like 10, because I would want the challenge. I want it to look really cool. I would have lots of plants. I would also in my fish room, if I was a separate three, I'd have an auto, auto water change because that's what I do. Um, that's what I would do. So that's, you know, but there's a lot of nano fish to choose from. You kind of just got to see what makes sense. Do you have a, a lid on the tank? What kind of shrimp do you have? How big are they? How much do you plan on feeding? How much do you plan on servicing? All of those things do have an impact. All right. I think I finally caught up. Whew. Let me answer. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the kibosh on it right now. Any more super chats? I'm not answering, so don't super chat. You can become a member. I'm gonna pick some stuff out of the the normal chat because I've been weaving that in, but I want to get a few more of those in. And uh, just know if you super chat now, I'm not gonna answer it. So don't do that if you want it answered. If you just want to say like tacos are amazing, that's fine. But otherwise, the show never ends, and I feel like I want to get some more uh, of these normal non-paid questions in see what I can do I'm gonna scroll way and take some stuff at random how do you feed a female betta that is in a tank with mollies uh I would probably just feed them all some frozen blood worms the, the female betta is gonna love it the mollies will love it you can get some other foods in there too but uh, real meaty things like that a female betta is pretty scrappy unless it's just like you know, 104 inch mollies to one female betta, it should work out okay and just feed enough so that there's enough to go around. The good news is mollies will feed off the bottom so if it gets past them, they'll clean it up afterwards. Just don't overload the tank to a point where you can't keep up with filtration. So, let me see here. Can I put CPDs and clown killies separately in summer tubs in Minnesota? What month should I start? I don't know. I like to start when it's pretty warm. I want water temps to not drop below 70 when they go out. They can stay out longer and go colder, but going from like 78 to 70 is already enough of a shift. I don't want it to go, ooh, it got down to 63 and now they're getting sick. Um, I'm not familiar enough with Minnesota. I would guess... I'm guessing June is a good month for most of the country, but you know, you and I've had years where it's like, oh, it's still really cold out. I've also had years where it gets warm way early. You could do what Dean does. Dean likes to set up heaters. So he might go, okay, I'm gonna I'm start in um, May, but I'm gonna put, maybe you do have that 500 watt heater, but I'm gonna put a heater out there, like a 100 watt heater. I'm gonna set it to 70. And I'm going to help try to, if that does go below 70, try to buffer it up at night. And that'll give me a longer growing season. He, you know, he's even got heaters out in his ponds right now when snow is on it. So that could be a way to get you a longer growing season out of that. 
What are my opinion on the Cohab beta tanks? I haven't seen one yet, so I don't know. Hmm. Oh, wait. I see. It's not a branded name. It's one male and three females and a heavily planted 30 gallon. Yeah, it can be done. Uh, I think it's on a per case basis. A lot of breeders can do it that way. It's, you know, I'm, I'm sure some beta, some beta nerds raging, but it's on a case by case basis. It, it's to me, it's no different. It's no different than asking, what do you think about dogs and cats living in the same house? Oh, I don't know. Is it working? Cool. It's super cool. I love cats and I love dogs. Oh, that dog chases the cat every time it tries to move. That sounds horrible for the cat. I don't, I don't endorse that at all. Right. But you know, there are, we know there's dogs that hate cats, right? And we know vice versa. And so if you're just asking, you can't go, well, of course it's going to work. Like, you know, I can't guarantee that, you know, this dog here and this kitten are going to get along. I can't guarantee that this old cat and this puppy is going to get along. Like there's, there's no, you just kind of have to go, oh, when it's, when I see it and it's working, it's great. When it's not working, not great at all and needs to be solved. And that's how I feel like with those planted tank. Sure. It's like saying, well, what if I own a, I own a, I own a whole farm. I own a whole farm, lots of room. I got lots of stay at home people. We already have two cats and two dogs. I want to add another dog to it. It might work. It also might not work. That dog might hate cats. It might hate other dogs. So it, you're going to have that, you're going to have that chance no matter what you do. And so my thoughts are, if you're going to do it, do it. Would I try it? Sure, I would. I've tried just about anything in aquatics, but I would know this isn't working. I need to solve this. And that's what I, I don't like seeing is when you're like, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, a little beat up and they're a little, you know, one, you know, one dies like every f six months. Like, well, that's not a working scenario. That's one getting assassinated every six months. Like, that's not, not great. Do I need to take out my carbon filter if I'm using the co-op Easy Green? I would recommend it. Yep. Uh, you know, part of it is carbon removes fertilizers in general, but so do plants. So like I would go, well, what do you need the carbon for? Oh, I got this in my water. Plants take care of that, right? There are some things like tannins they won't. There's a few things that won't. But in general, those two kind of don't, you know, it's kind of like saying, should I take the training wheels off my dirt bike? And you're like, wait, what? You have why do you have training wheels on my dirt bike? Well, I don't really know how to ride one yet. Like, you know how to ride a bike? No? Okay, well, let's put training wheels on a bicycle. Ride that. Then we're going to make a step up to a dirt bike. You know, it's kind of one of those, like, these just don't pair. Like, this shouldn't go. Um, yeah, that's, by the way, that's the best analogy I've ever given. <laughs> All right. Centerpiece fish for 29 gallon. I've got some guppies, some snails, some autos, and some platies. In my opinion, the platies kind of are that centerpiece fish, but uh, one Bolivian ram if I was to choose something else. Good tank ideas for a paludarium. It's 40 gallons of water, not total. I always like stuff that's breeding. Um, well, no. So I do like guppies and that kind of stuff, but one you could you could utilize some fish that will do some stuff out of water, like uh, splash tetras. Look up splash tetras, hunt them down, and then you'll be like, wow, that's going to be amazing. They lay their eggs on a leaf above the water, and they splash them all day long till they hatch, and then they fall back into the water. I would do a setup like that, or like archer. Well, I, that's too small for archers, but I'd be doing something. What takes advantage of a paludarium, and something like splash tetras would for you. Can you post a link for a video on when to change water, please? I mean, we have a guide for it. I've got a video called Why Do We Change Water? That's probably the best way to answer. It's a long video, though, because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not as easy as like, well, you do it every four days. It's purely based on how much waste is in the water, what parameters are in the water, do you have hormones in the water, are you trying to breed a fish? Like there's a lot of things that go into deciding when should I change water? And uh, yeah, when or why do we change water? I'll find the link real quick. Yeah, why do you change water is a 24 minute long epilogue pretty much on 
why we change water. What's crazy to me is I just saw that that video is three years old and I was sitting in the same position. I did not think this tank is three years, over three years old. That's crazy to me. Time flies, but there it is. All right. I'm curious about what kind of floor you're using in the new fish room. I'm using gym floor mats. So it's like, I think they call it eight millimeter thick rubber. Same that I use in my fish room. Uh, it can get wet. It, it also is very grippy when there's a wet floor so you don't slip. Uh, I use it with the blue sprinkled in so that way if you drop some food or something, it doesn't instantly stand out against a black, um, black tile, I guess. So it looks, I guess it looks a little messy so that, that when we drop something, it doesn't even look more messy. Pea puffers only eating snails. Any other recommendations? Frozen blood worms. That's what I would take them. Do, does chlorine and chloramine damage aquatic plants? I filled a fishless tank cycle with chlorine water, and after a week, my swords, crypts, and pogo stemmen are severely melting. I don't know. I don't know that I've ever, uh, like, intentionally put them through that stress. So, like... My first thing would be, even if it didn't hurt the plants, so your fishless tank, right? You probably want bacteria. So even if it didn't harm the plants in a negative way, it would harm the bacteria that would have come in on the plants. So I've always dechlorinated because it just, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to keep an aquatic environment. I know that like maybe the, yeah. I mean, maybe if you're trying to like get rid of snails, but I know it won't get rid of the snails. And I've only ever experienced very low levels of chlorine in Washington, very low levels. So chloramine is more, uh, I don't know if the right nerd term is caustic. Is chlor chloramine more caustic, like a caustic agent? I'm going to Google it. Because mm. caustic could just only mean like bleach or something. Well, caustic soda, hold on. Sometimes I, I think I, fa I sound fancy, and then other times I'm like, I'm probably just full of it. That's not right at all. I, mean, I know, like, the definition would mean an agent that is kind of like, like, I don't know if the right definition of, like, you know, you can use Coke to, like, clean things. I don't know if that qualifies as a caustic agent or not. Well, my Google food's not getting me there. Someone will put it in the comments and educate me that knows a better definition than I. Pineapple pizza on, uh, or pineapple on pizza. I think my wife, yeah, she deleted your comment. That's a, I was going to say, I was like, how dare you for even suggesting it? Someone, someone timed that person out purely on pineapple on pizza is disgusting. And I don't care. I don't care that 50% of you are going to be like, you're wrong. I know you're wrong. This is one of the undisputable truths on the planet is that pineapple on pizza is bad. If you love it, just keep it to yourself. We know you're a weirdo. Like, yeah. I'm always, I always shake my head when we order pizza and someone's like, I want, I want pineapple on my pizza. I'm just like, ah, oh, jeez. I just, I can't stand it. I just, yeah, not good for me in there. And, and obviously, you know, not good for me. I have to hate it. That's, that's the way my, when it comes to food, I'm very, very opinionated. Very. You don't get a body like this by eating pineapple, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Caustic is high pH, or Coke is acidic. I see. So I have it. What, what was I originally talking about? I was, oh, chloramine and chlorine. Yeah, so exactly. I just sound like a fool, because that doesn't mean that at all. Yeah. Quick talk on cyano and planet tanks, how it starts, and how to fix it. Well, officially, no one knows how it starts, at least in all the research papers I've ever read, uh, because it, one, they can't even identify where it even came from in the world. Like, as in one day, you know, something landed from space, there it is. Like, they don't know the origin of it. They also can't 100% identify what causes it to bloom in the wild or in tanks. We've got theories. Some people will say like, oh, it's high nitrates. And then you can have tanks with no nitrates getting it. You can say 
that it's a lack of this and then you have the opposite. So I don't, in general, I, I find that it crops up in situations where water might be a little stagnant and water parameters maybe aren't the best. Now, that's very ambiguous. The best way to cure it, I find, is improving circulation in an aquarium and staying on top of water parameters. That doesn't mean changing water all the time. It just means like you're not neglecting a tank. And then I have to use an antibiotic to get rid of it. Once I have it, I've never been able to really, really get rid of it without an antibiotic. I can make it look pretty good. I can make it seem like it's not there anymore, but it always comes back. But if I hit it with an antibiotic after changing things, like, okay, I changed the power head, I changed the air stone, I got some flow, I moved the plants around, moved this piece of wood, I can get it to where it won't come back sometimes. And uh, so I, I wish it was as easy as like, oh man, turns out, you know, X causes it. Illuminate X goes away. But I have not found that. I do know that it likes to have light. I know it likes to have some nutrients. And it likes water that's not as fast, but that doesn't mean you won't find it like it's, it's freaking right on a rock in front of the outflow of my filter. That doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, it's it's a very hard one. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, when I was really researching, this was like probably seven years ago, they still did not have it nailed down to what really, really will uh, knock it out and where what causes it. So... Yeah, for talking tacos, crunchy tacos are tacos. Soft tacos are burritos. I have not gone down that rant train in too many years, but yes, from legacies ago, if you watch old live streams, and well established. It's on a tortilla that has not been deep fried, basically. It is a burrito. I'm not even gonna put up like the meme of change my mind, because my mind cannot be changed. Best bottom feeder for bare bottom tanks. We find uh, corridors to do a superb job. How do you become a master breeder? Uh, usually you'll have a local aquarium club that uh, has a, a breeder award program. And one of their top levels after you've worked your way through the ranks would get you there. So that means submitting spawns and proving and maybe writing some articles. And uh, depending on the club might be X amount of points might be X amount of points in different species. Uh, like the live bear club, ALA, you have to have like out of every species, two out of every like group. And it gets, pr it's pretty difficult to be a master um, live bearer breeder. It's, it's a crazy task. So. All righty. Can you remove the black rim from a smaller size tank to make them rimless and keep them stable? Dangerous one to answer that way, but for the most part, yes. I highly recommend, if you're gonna do it, just remove the top. The bottom still provides a lot of uh, structure there. Also, depending on the manufacturer, you could have very sharp edges. I like rim tanks over rimless in general. Can it be done? Yes, if I said no, that would uh, not be fair because lots of people do it. So I just don't like doing it. Didn't dechlorinate because I was trying to clear out a culminaris outbreak. I pulled the fish into a separate quarantine tank with salt. I see. So plants in there um, with the chlorinator. Hmm. Yeah, I, I never... Be part of it, like... I never... How do I say this? I wouldn't move the fish because I know I'm leaving the disease behind. So like in, in that scenario, my brain goes, wait a second, you just put plants in there. Does that mean you didn't have plants before and therefore you could have just salted that tank and cured the fish and any remnants of Colmenaris in that tank at the same time? Hmm. Hmm. I thought the full determined whether it's crunchy or, or burrito. No, you fool. No. If you fold a tortilla like this, right? It's still a burrito. It's a tortilla. Just because you don't know how to fold a burrito doesn't make something a taco, right? Because 
by your definition, a hot dog bun would be a taco. It's not a taco either. But it is a burrito. Better believe that. Ceramic media or fluidized K1 media? I think it really depends on size of system. Ceramic media tends to be more compact, easier to work with, not as loud. K1, usually you're using bigger systems. There are exceptions to that. I find myself using more ceramic than I do K1. Aquahuna doesn't shift to Washington? What? Huh? Yes, they do not ship to Washington because they'd like to stay in business. People freak out about that all the time, and they go, but there's 22 people that want to order fish that live in Washington. Yes, but there's 52 stores that want to order from Aquahuna who would not order from him if he was selling directly to their customers. So he makes, one, he makes more money, and two, he gets to stay in business with his main business, which is wholesale fish, by not shipping to Washington. But that's not fair, I live in Washington. You're right, it's not. Like, it's not any less fair than having aquarium glazier in Germany that has like the coolest fish around. Like, it's not fair, I don't live in Germany, I can't order from them. You know, it's just one of those things, like, yep, you get beautiful nature, you could drive to the aquarium co-op, you live in our state, you could get overnight shipping for you know, all the time when you order from Aquarium Club, there's benefits and there's minuses to everywhere you live. And I realize this person has not said any of that, but these are the things we run into continually with, why don't they sell to people in Washington? Why do they do this? Why don't that happen? This isn't fair. This is fair. That's not fair. You know, unfortunately, life's not fair. And one plus for someone is a negative for others. You know, I could, my new house, let's say I was next door to uh uh a street taco place. I'd be like, this is not fair. Why isn't it a crunchy taco place? Like it just, it is what it is, you know? And so, you know, the good news is you can still order from other vendors. You know, there's other vendors out there on the West coast that are good too. Right. People that live in Florida, they can buy directly from farms. That's an advantage for them. Right. But their disadvantages, they typically have, well, in my opinion, the stores I visited were, uh, a little, what do I want to call it? Rough? I don't know if rough is the right word. There wasn't a selection in the stores because some of those farms were selling directly to the customer. And so when you see that happen, right, then other wholesalers can go, wait, so stores are going to struggle if I sell directly to their customer in this area? And then I'll lose those sales. That's not good either. So the benefit is, you know, and so part of the problem is this, I believe. People will often say they won't ship to me. That's not fair because I live in Washington. And then they go, I also live four hours away from Aquarium Club. I can't come there and buy. But you also got to realize there's a ton of other fish stores that can choose to buy from Aquahuna or already do. And if you're the guy that lives 10 hours from society, that's kind of a choice that's been made. Now, there are lots of fish stores in Washington, a lot of them. You might not know where all of them are, uh, and they might not all order from them, but they could, and it's his it's his business, right? Like, arguably, I wouldn't lose that much money if he sold to people in Washington because we get a portion of what gets sold anyway. So it wouldn't even be that bad for us. However, it would be very detrimental to our competitors, and that wouldn't be very fair of like, oh, that's not a, that's not a very good deal for the, you know, and I... As much as I love to be competitive, it's like sports competitive. Like if if you don't have anyone to play tennis against, even if you're the best at tennis, it no longer means anything, right? Same thing. If somehow we become so good at our jobs that we put every other fish store out of business, is that even a good thing? I don't think it is. I think competition is good, right? I think it keeps me on my toes. I think it serves more people, gets more people in the hobby and all of that. And so I definitely make decisions. Like I bet you I could have struck a deal if I had tried hard enough to go, how do we stick it to all the other local stores and help Aquarium Co-op? But that, you know, that's not good for the hobby. And I'm sure there's other things we do that aren't good for the hobby too. Like, oh, well, this and that and this and that. 
we try to do our best. That's that's the my guiding principle is do what we can, you know, and we can't do everything, can't do everything right. I can't even uh, you know, what last time I live streamed on on a channel, um I pronounced genre genere. Uh caustic agents are wrong in this one. Like, you know, there's gonna be mistakes. The goal is just to, you know, ninety-five times out of a hundred we're getting it right. The five, like, okay, you got to cut, you know, you don't have to, but you know, I always say, you know, cut me some slack. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And that's what I can only ask of anyone, you know? So yeah. All right. I really, I really do got to cut this short. I'm getting hungry, I'm getting hungry. I think I'm going to have, maybe if my wife is listening right now. How about some guacamole? We've got some avocados to use up and boy, howdy, do I love some fresh guacamole. I'm not going to let this taco thing go. I'm heated right now. I don't know what your stance is, but if it's anything other than mine, you're wrong. So is a corn dog a burrito on a stick? Of course. I don't even know why that's a question. Hmm. Fishless cycling a 29-gallon tank at the point where 24 hours after ammonia dosing, ammonia and nitrites is zero. Yeah, I feel like something's missing. Are you asking if you're like good to go? Seemingly yes. If there's another part to the question I am not seeing. Hmm. But just be careful because a lot of people do that. Then they wait a week to go buy fish and then they realize they actually lost the bacteria and then they're like, oh no, why do I have ammonia? I had it, then I lost it, then I had it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, but also open a store in my house. Yeah. You know, I honestly hope, my hope has always been this. Lead by example, and we I talk about this all the time when we talk about, are we going to open more stores? What else? Are we going to wholesale? Are we going to do all these things? And I know that when I came up, I saw an opportunity, and I go, look how bad this is being done. I think I can do better. I have no doubt that there are 20 other stores or businesses or whatever doing the same thing. Look at Aquarium Co-op and how they're missing all these opportunities and doing this wrong. They will eventually overtake like wherever I am, right? Like, I don't know if we're like, are we step number 29? Are we second? Are we 444th? Like whatever that is, right? Like, I don't know. It depends on what we're looking at. But that's the way business in the world works, you know? And so the hope is that... Uh, the hope is that other people get inspired and so they go, hey, I'm going to be that aquarium co-op of this state, of this country. And so we see a lot of ideas implemented that we helped pioneer. I don't, I don't know that anyone truly generate, generally or genuinely pioneers something. Like usually there's an idea somewhere, that kind of stuff, right? And you, you, you bring in all sources and you, you bundle them up and try to put something good out there. Um. But what I would be afraid of is if we just go, oh, yeah, we're everywhere now. Like, how do we make sure we're not just another, another big box store? Because I believe, I believe what makes Aquarium Co-op so good is the people we have. Like, we've only got one candy, right? If we're really lucky, we find another one, right? But that's not infinitely scalable. Same thing with Robert, our general manager, with, with, with Jimmy, with so many of our employees, they're not just scale them up, right? Because what makes us so good is that we have these people that really care, that are knowledgeable at their jobs, that want to see it thrive, that want to do all of this. And we could get crazy lucky and whew, we have 50 aquarium co-ops and everyone really trying hard and somehow we can manage that many people and everyone's fulfilled and everything is great. But I know that Usually, the bigger it gets, the harder it is to manage, the harder it is to keep that up. And in general, big corporations, what is good for one person is not good for another. So we find something going on here in Washington, and we got to make a change. Turns out the Aquarium Co-op in Colorado, that's a terrible change, right? And so we just go, hey, let's just do our little thing. And that's the thing. Our little thing is we sell some stuff online. We make some videos, 
and we service our local clientele. And we do that as best we can. And I change hats all the time, several times a day. Okay, I gotta think like I'm a store owner right now. I gotta think like I'm a hobbyist. I gotta think like I'm an online retailer. I gotta think like I'm a YouTuber, right? I have to put all these hats and go from this angle, what makes sense, right? And then from this angle, what makes sense? And I can't imagine bringing in like, okay, as a wholesaler shipping to everyone else, how can I make it so the hobbyist is happy, make sure aquarium co-op makes money, make sure store number two makes money after paying shipping, and they have the right messaging and help to go along with that product, you know, and that we don't end up having, so let's say we sold, as an example, let's take a product that is very customer intensive, a CO2 regulator. Let's say we sell 50 of those a month, which we don't sell any right now, and Candy's going, oh geez, I got tickets every day on CO2 problems. We then wholesale it out, and now we're selling 500 a month. Now Candy has 50 tickets a day about CO2 problems. And we already established we can't scale Candy. She's amazing. We can find other people, they can help, right? And, but at a certain point when you scale, you're not gonna be able to go like, okay, if Dean can build one house by himself and it takes six months, we can't find another Dean. Dean could hire 500 people and now he can build lots of houses, but there can be a lot more mistakes, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid is like, look, we just wanna, we want it so that you buy that house from Dean, you know what you're getting and we can deliver it instead of, what do you mean the warehouse in Colorado didn't ship on time? What do you mean this is going on? What do you mean? You know, I had to drive employees to get them to work during a snowstorm. We have to go into the airport in the middle of the night. How do we know that the equivalent person managing that job in another state could do that? As in, is their airport open late enough? Two, could they get there? How do we tackle these issues that we have no experience? If I live in Washington and I don't deal with six months of winter somewhere, how do I know what the retail store is going to be like when snow is or isn't happening? How do I know how to advise them what hours to be open or closed based on, like we base that on uh, traffic. Traffic is terrible in Washington. So we base our hours we're open based on that. That might not apply at all in Maine or wherever, right? So that's our thing is we'll let other stores, other people, you know, do their thing. We've tried to lay out the blueprint as in we haven't really hidden much. Like, yeah, we're not going to tell you go to this manufacturer and buy this when you have this much money at this stage. But for the most part, you could watch through all the videos and see how, what, what step they take there, what they do then, what they do then. And there you go. You kind of have a blueprint. Now, doesn't mean our blueprint's the best, right? It's like a house blueprint. Oh, all right. I'm going to change this. I want a bigger garage. We're going to need a fish room over here. I need a shed. I need a bigger kitchen. I need four bedrooms. I need this. You can change the blueprint. So, yeah. I'm done. I feel bad, but I did say I wasn't going to answer these super chats, and I'm done. And I feel like if I answer them, I'll be going back on my word. So, Arctic Dark, Trevor, and Jacob, I'm sorry. They all pretty much have to do with the new building and all of that. There will be a new video about the new building coming out after this live stream. If you are a member, you will get to watch that. I will, before eating guacamole, I will release that. It'll be very crude because I don't even think it has a thumbnail yet. Hopefully, Jimmy will make a thumbnail for it. But I'll release that to the members as a thank you for being a member. It's just behind the scenes stuff. You get to see extra stuff, maybe stuff that's not juicy enough for that don't make the edits. And you get to see stuff a little ahead of time, but all the main, you know, all the main courses you get through the main channel anyway. So, all right, I'll see you guys later. I fit this, fit this random two hour and 30 minute live stream in like it was nothing. Whew. All right, we'll see how the 4K came out. I should be in 4K today too. All right. Let me hit the button. I almost hit the wrong button. Would have screwed this whole thing up. Oh, no.